Hello, this is Dr. Grande. Welcome to this episode of The Murder Part. Tonight, we'll be looking at the case of William Leslie Arnold. We'll get started with introductions. Jeff? My name is Jeff Pinson, and I'm a licensed mental health counselor at Delaware in Pennsylvania, uh, specializing in the treatment of OCD and other anxiety disorders. And uh, if you leave a comment or a question below, we may respond in future episodes uh, or with potentially with uh, YouTube shorts uh, we might come out with here shortly. Um, but if I hadn't become a counselor, what I really wanted to do, I really wanted to supply prison inmates with hacksaw blades. I mean, you got to figure a lot of prison inmates would want that. It's got to be a pretty lucrative service. A lot of demand. A lot of demand, right? I imagine so. Sure. Um, a, lot of, a lot of woodworking going on in prisons and whatnot. Exactly. That's exactly why I would want to do that. The only reason is for the woodworking, right? Turns out prison guards, police, everyone else in the world other than the inmates, they don't like it. So I might make a good living, but might get in a lot of trouble for doing it. So I had to shatter that dream, go to counseling. Shh. Mm. Yeah. Another tough break. Right. Shattered yeah. dreams. It was. It's, it's tough. It's tough. Uh, Mike? All right. My name is Mike Smith, also a licensed professional counselor in the state of Delaware, uh, focusing on narrative therapy, geek therapy, and I am a self-styled expert in all things geek. Uh, had I had I not become a counselor, at one time in my life, I, I, was, I was profiting off of the personalized delivery of masks and mannequin heads, right? Like right, right around Halloween, you, you think, you know, just to scare people, you, you, you hire yourself out to just put a mannequin head somewhere, like in somebody's window at night you know, when they wake up and go to the bathroom. Right, boom, of scare. Turns out that in the, in the summertime, not a lot of people want that service. The people who do tend to be... Prisoners in in uh, prisons, and you know that kind of personalized delivery of masks and mannequin heads, um, without guards seeing, it, desirable by prisoners, right, right, frowned upon by police, mm. and you know rule number one: don't go to prison. Right, so, right. unfortunately, that dream uh, shattered very quickly, mm. and uh, had to had to settle for counseling. Uh. That's the, tough, Mike. Another road of shattered dreams. Yeah. yeah. The, the right. road to counseling truly is paved by shattered dreams. <laughs> mm. <laughs> so, so this case, uh, this is a murder part episode. It could easily be an alien lizard humanoids episode as well. And we say this a lot about cases. Like, this is like the wildest case ever. This one has to be <laughs> one of the wildest ever. It's up there. It is. It's up there. Uh, this was featured in... Uh, some type of newspaper, I think. Like Omaha. Omaha Herald, I think it was. Is that, is that the one it was? They did a three-part series uh, prior to kind of like the big news of this case happening. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and then they did like a fourth, uh, like another article where they you know, added some of the details. Yeah, right? I, think, I think the initial article was in 2017, and then it was in 2022 when everything else broke. Mm -hmm. It's a big update. Yeah, right. Yeah, big update. So... When you it's like at, unsolved mysteries. Like <laughs> when you look at like missing persons or or in this case escaped persons, uh, you know usually we think all right they they went somewhere and, and died. Yeah, they were murdered or something else happened. But there's no way they are alive and working some job or something like that. Like there's no <laughs> and there's certainly not another country prospering. Right. Right. Well, spoiler alert. Yeah. Well, spoiler yeah. alert. <laughs> <laughs> That's kind of what happened here. <laughs> So let's hear kind of the brief version of, uh, of Mr. William Leslie Arnold. Yeah. And, right. and don't forget the murder part. Yeah, okay. right. Murder part's an important part of this. <laughs> so uh, Will's, William Leslie Arnold uh, went by Leslie. Uh, <clears throat> much more popular name for guys back then than it is today. I'd, I've never met anyone today named Leslie. I don't know if you guys have or uh, not. It, it, was, it was his middle name, right? And his dad was also, well, he was named after his dad, so his mm -hmm. dad was also William Leslie Arnold. Right. So in order to avoid con confusion, he went by his middle name. Nonetheless, I don't know anyone, any guy by the name of Leslie. Uh, so much more popular back then. Of course, Leslie Nielsen, one of my favorites. I think he, I think uh, uh, William also went by Les based on the, uh, like one of the interviews mm. that they did. So it could have been like Les or Leslie. Sure. Uh, but yeah, I, I, you don't see too many like children these days being given that name. Yeah. You know, it's, it's a name that I think was popular for a while and has kind of faded. Yeah. Um, 
But Leslie uh, Nielsen was Canadian, I believe. Mm -hmm. So it must have been popular over there during the same time. Maybe. Uh, but yeah, it's, I would agree, it's not a name that's uh, very popular these days. Mm -hmm. Right, right. So he was born in 1942 in Nebraska. Uh, as a teenager, he was described as having anger problems um, and, uh, <clears throat> you know, had, had some problems of his own. Um, the murder part comes into play earlier than we experience with, with many of the cases we, we cover. Yeah, a lot of our cases is like we spend a lot of time building up to like, these are the things that yeah. laid the road to, to murder. No, no, this, this, this one starts out with the murder part. Mm -hmm. Right, right. And then gets... And then gets weirder. Even weirder after there. that. So September 27, 1958, uh, 16-year-old Leslie, planning to take his girlfriend to a drive-in movie using one of his parents. Um, there were issues between... Cars. One of his parents' cars. What did I say? You said just one of his parents. One of his parents. One of his parents' can have cars. One of his parents, his parents were going to carry him and his so, girlfriend. So, hey, Dad, you're going to carry me and my girlfriend <laughs> to the drive-in, right? So he's going to borrow one of the cars. Uh, issues between him and his mom. Uh, he retrieved a gun, shot his mom multiple times. Dad comes in after that, shoots his dad. Uh, ends up, um, <clears throat> excuse me, ends up uh, calling a family friend, saying that his parents had to go away unexpectedly, uh, and, and if she could watch his younger brother, which she agreed. Um, he <clears throat> took his girlfriend to the movies that night, buried his parents in the backyard the next day, opened his dad's business on Monday, uh, told them, hey, my parents had to go somewhere, business is open. Um, and then uh, his, bro his younger brother went back to the house a few days later, not expect you know, not noticing anything was wrong or thinking anything was wrong. Uh, it, on October 5th, some days later, his grandparents came to the house, tried to find his parents. Uh, they quickly realized, uh, not so quickly, but they realized something's up here. Well, well here, the interesting thing is the thing that uh, Leslie told his neighbor to, was that his parents had to take a train out of town because his grandfather, who was going senile, had taken the train and gotten off on a stop and not gotten back on the train. Mm -hmm. So they had to go try and find him. And on October 5th, when his grandparents showed up, it was that grandfather right, right. <laughs> that his parents were supposedly trying to find. They were supposed to be in Wyoming. Showed up, yeah, yeah, like they, they showed up, like that grandfather yeah. showed up. And that's when the neighbor went, Huh. Something's <laughs> wrong here. Yeah. Maybe he wasn't entirely honest with me about that. <laughs> so October 10th, uh, it called the police. Uh, the grandparents did. Uh, Leslie confessed to the murders, um, showed him the locations of the parents' body. He was charged with murder um, and sentenced to life in prison, but only needed to serve 10 years to be eligible for release. So uh, goes to prison, model prisoner, earned his GED, tutored others, prison, played in the prison band, everything. It was the clarinet. What, saxophone. Saxophone. Play the saxophone. Yeah. He also learned how to play the piano or taught himself how to play the piano while he was in prison. So by all means, model prisoner. So uh, 1968 comes around. He was close to getting to possibly being released. It was close to that 10-year mark. Um, he escaped from prison. And we'll go through all the details of it, but it involved hacksaw blades being passed over by an inmate that was recently paroled. I could have provided that service, but no. Except no. for it was it was many decades before you were born. <laughs> right. But, but I could have provided that service when I was born. Turns out it's frowned upon, of course. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so break out of prison. Um, and uh, won't give all the details away, but uh, <clears throat> Leslie wasn't found. Um, and at some point they just assumed he had escaped, he had died, he had, something had happened to him. Never seen again. Right. That brings us to 2022. Many years later, uh, a man in Australia uploaded his DNA to a genealogy website. Uh, it was determined that he was the son of Leslie Arnold. Um, and so they learned all the details. At that point, they learned all the details about the life that Leslie Arnold had lived after he escaped from prison, involving uh, having a family, you know, getting married, having a family, having multiple jobs, moving to different places, different countries, different continents. Uh, and he never opened up about his past to his family at that point. Um, and they didn't know anything about him until, uh, you know, that point as well. So he died in 2010 at 67 years old from complications due to blood clots. And his family would not have been any wiser had his son not uploaded his DNA uh, to this 
genealogy website. So a lot of twists and turns here. Totally unexpected. The thing that Leslie always told uh, his kids was that he was an orphan from Chicago. Mm -hmm. And after he died, his son wanted to know more about his dad and his family. That's why he was looking at genealogy. They never expecting to find out that his father was an escaped (laughs) murder prisoner. Like... (laughs) That's not yeah. the kind of thing I would expect looking up my dad's right. history. Like, well, maybe you should now. I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> I'm not sure I want to know. <laughs> you know, kind of, it's one of these things like, what are the chances? Mm. Right? Like, maybe maybe you find out he wasn't really an orphan, but he, he did some other things, whatever, yeah. um, embarrassing past or something. Sure. But um, prison escapee? Yeah. That has to be pretty far down the list of Apply. outcomes for right. DNA submission. <laughs> yeah, that depends. On, on your parents, <laughs> but apparently, as as it was John Damon, James Damon, John what was his name. His um, last name is definitely Damon. Uh, apparently, he was a great father. Mm-hmm. Like not the kind of person you would expect of being an escaped prisoner. Mm-hmm. There's some dads out there. You'd definitely be like, you've been to prison. <laughs> <laughs> I, I know you've been tell. to prison. I know you've been to prison. You don't even want to talk about it, but I know you've been there. <laughs> but apparently, not him. living yeah. as as, uh, as John Damon, Damon, he did not uh, did, get, did not give off that vibe. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it was John Vincent Damon. John Vincent yeah. Damon, yeah. And his uh, tombstone has the wrong date on it, which causes some confusion because he had modified his date of birth. Mm. Yeah. Uh, so he has a tombstone with another name in another country. Uh, and I, my understanding is, you know, he was, he was left there, right? That's... Yeah. Well, yeah. that's who he was to his family. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yep. So uh, going back to the beginning uh, with this case, uh, Leslie's father owned a regional office of direct sales company, sold a variety of goods. It sounds like maybe door-to-door, yeah, something like that. Yeah. Um, it's other things like spices. Mm-hmm. And, and other things, household like other goods. products, household mm-hmm. goods. Um, so it's likely direct sales definitely sounds, especially in the 50s, was door-to-door. Right. Like, yeah. So I think, you know, for, for younger people these days, that might seem like, what? You can sell door-to-door? It was actually pretty normal. Yeah. Uh, and and it, it was a reputable job. Now it's like, oh, you have to sell door-to-door? You're one of those mm-hmm. people? Right. It's like like telemarketers, so like the bottom. Right. And annoyance. The bottom feeders. The bottom of the barrel. It's, yeah, the bottom rung of like the uh, the career ladder. But... But, a, but like a sometimes, good... sometimes, uh, sometimes people put fast food workers above telemarketers, as far as like the respect level of a particular job, and uh, like the the whole door to door salesperson would be beneath telemarketers. Mm. Yeah, they're pretty they're pretty frowned upon. A lot of neighborhoods have um, rules about well, they're hard to enforce, but like no soliciting right, right. rules where it's just a bunch of evil stares. I don't think you can really do anything unless it's like a gated community or whatever. But even then, it's it's dicey. It's hard yeah. to keep people from knocking on doors. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, I mean, there it was like you would go around and you would probably have certain customers that you would dealt with before. Like, oh, good, you're back. Mm-hmm. I need another like spoon or yeah, oregano. I don't know, whatever, whatever it is that <laughs> he was selling. I need another pinch of sugar. <laughs> I'm t- well, you- tired of borrowing from the neighbor. Depending, I guess, depending on where you're at, you would normally have people maybe delivering milk or cheese, things like that. So it wouldn't be uncommon for mm-hmm. people to regularly come to your house for different goods like that. So mm-hmm. you're right. It might be a common thing. Oh, you're back. I need more of this stuff. Yeah. So it, it probably was considered kind of respectable. Yeah. Uh, whereas now it would be probably more frowned upon mm-hmm. in, in a lot of areas. We're a lot more paranoid these days. Yeah. Yeah. Do you guys ever get... Um, there's a place called, I think it's called the Meat Shop or something like that. Do you guys ever get the, they drive in around in a van and say, hey, we got some extra beef or we got some extra brisket, we got some whatever, whatever. Uh, you want to buy some really good prices, whatever, and they, they have these sales pitches. Yeah, the meat's terrible. I've not, I, it's... I wouldn't even want to try it. Even if I ate meat, I wouldn't even want to try it because why would I buy meat out of a van, for one thing? And I don't want you trying to sell meat to me or anything. <laughs> While I'm just out in my yard with my kids. <laughs> you have all the products yeah. that you could sell in that way. And those, those guys are popular. They're all over the place. Yeah. There was a, a case in, uh, I think, in the Pacific Northwest I covered a, a woman who was killed. And one of the, the uh, potential suspects was a guy who killed someone else. And he sold meat in, like, a modified pickup truck or a van or something. Like, drive around. And, yeah. and she bought some. That's how they, they tracked them down. They found the meat. Oh, my gosh. Um, right. 
in her in her freezer yeah. refrigerator. So, oh my gosh. yeah, a lot of times they they have they have commission. Somebody orders a bunch of meat. They go to do the delivery, and then the person refuses to take the mm-hmm. delivery. So yeah, they've got this this stuff that uh, that they've already taken out. They can't if they take it back. They don't get paid for mm-hmm. it. So they're trying to just sell it. Yeah, and they're trying well, to get rid of it because then when they go back, they don't have it. They. I think most of those people. That's a that's a line though. Like mm-hmm. they they load up in the morning with the meat and take yeah. it out. Like it's I don't I don't know if there ever was like this truck with meat that didn't get delivered. I think these guys are <laughs> I'm sure, pretty I'm much sure they know. I'm sure they know that when they go out, there's going to be somebody that refuses delivery. So they make plans for, well, okay, after, after somebody refuses, we're going to go over here and we're going to try and sell it. But a lot of times it's like opportunistic sales. They're not just going door to door. They're just like, we got to get rid of this meat. Hey, you want to buy some meat? <laughs> seems so odd. This seems like such an odd price. It like, is. Who, who thought of that? Every time you say no, they're like, come on, you got to eat, right? Yes, of course I do, but I don't want this. <laughs> no, I do not have to eat. I am a robot. <laughs> I am immune from eating. <laughs> I am an yeah. alien lizard humanoid. I <laughs> ate 100 years ago. I don't need to do it again for the next 50. <laughs> oh, man. Yeah, that's, that's probably one of the kind of like one of those things you could sell would have the most concern attached to it. Like, yeah. like how long, how warm is that meat? Right, how long has right. it been sitting in this truck? Right. You know, like what? <laughs> it's in some weird cooler and you're like, yeah. is that really even doing anything? Yeah, it feels like a toaster or something. Yeah, I don't know, it's a toaster, but like <laughs> meat, I mean, it expires. I, they're I usually not great cuts of meat either. Like oh, they're, yeah. they're not. Like I, I'd rather go like, like if I'm going to get some good quality meat at a decent price, I'd rather go down to the University of Delaware. I think you have better luck trying to sell the cows. <laughs> Probably. If you bring uh, a hey, cow hey, around the you neighborhood. Know what you, get for, you know what you get for a cow? Uh, three magic beans. Well, there you go. Right? There you go. <laughs> so I was trying to deliver this cow. And the guy was like, mm, you know, I changed my mind. You got any uh, beans? You're going to be stuck with the cow. <laughs> so I thought, well, let me just drive around the neighborhood. Would you like a cow? I walked it around the neighborhood. Everyone was interested. <laughs> you want a cow? You got any beans? <laughs> Come on. I know you got beans. I know you got them. I know you got beans. Just give me them. <laughs> so that was what that was what uh, Leslie's dad did either right. way. His mother, his name was Opal. That's also a pretty unusual name. Mm-hmm. Opal. I don't know if I've ever heard that, actually, as a woman's name. I have. Have you heard it? Along with, like, Pearl. Oh, okay, yeah. 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 Some of those gemstones, they, they get, mm-hmm. they, they've been made into names. Yeah. Yeah. Pearl's also not a common name. I've heard that one, but I don't know if that's super common either. Right. Maybe just a kind of a phase that, that a generation went through where there were certain names. It happens a lot. So she was a stay-at-home mom, and Leslie had a younger brother, who you mentioned, named Jim. Uh, when he was 16, the family lived in a house. There was a photo of it in, in that Omaha, was mm-hmm. it Omaha World Herald or something? Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah. And uh, you know, reasonably nice. I yeah. mean, normal looking house. It's not know, a bad looking house. What you'd kind of expect for kind of like middle class Omaha. Mm-hmm. You know? um, so yeah, he was, uh, he was rambunctious, angry, but intelligent. And they said when he lost control of emotions, when he lost control of his emotions, he would become violent. Mm-hmm. Like he was just, Reach a point. Played the saxophone. Was active in baseball, wrestling. But, but come on, in in the nineteen fifties, you think about the threshold for what was considered violent. Uh, in some areas, it, it was way higher than it is now. Like disciplining your child, mm-hmm. like what we consider like completely out of out of bounds. Like you can't can't do that. That's we're taking your kids away from you. Phew. Way down here. Yeah. But especially from a child or a teenager, there was like it was much more magnified the other direction. You know, if it punched a wall, wow, you could send him to prison or right. send anti-social. him to social. So he's an anti social. He's a sociopath. They <laughs> gotta get rid of him. Like he's gonna be like but he directly punched a wall. Like wouldn't even like at certain points, uh, especially in this particular story. He did put a hole in the wall. Mm-hmm. But there were other times where he he just kind of lashed out at like a tree. I uh, like smacked at a branch or something like that, and then they said that he was he was freaking out. Uh, but that is because he was younger than eighteen. Right. Uh, and and yeah, his mom had a lot of stuff to do with that. Mm-hmm. Had a lot to do with the way he reacted to things. Yeah, 
she she seemed like she was pretty uh, rigid and uh, unhelpful. She kicked him out of the house on three separate occasions. Apparently, there's some type of stable nearby where he lived. I guess in walking distance, mm -hmm. sleep there. Um, again, you know, these days you'd have a SWAT team descending on there for trespassing, but back then, especially in places like Omaha, a lot of farms. Mm -hmm. You know, you have a city. There's Lincoln not too far away, but there's really nothing around Omaha outside of Lincoln. Like yeah. it's just rural, you know. So trespassing wasn't exactly um, an offense where you know the SWAT team would descend, like like these days. Well, yeah, I think in the fifties it would have been trespassing if it had been just a hobo in the in the in the in the mm -hmm. stables and we're like, oh, there's a stranger I don't know. That's trespassing. But like, oh, that's you know that's Leslie from from down the way. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Let him slim sleep. <laughs> you yep. want to get him a uh, pillow and a blanket? <laughs> sure. Yeah, we know him. It's not trespassing. <laughs> there was also a lot more, I think, discretion without the, the body cams, or especially like local police, yeah. you know, would let a lot go, es especially if you had parents who were reputable. Mm -hmm. you know, it, was, it was definitely like there was a system there yeah. where um, the police didn't look to rock the boat with supporters. Mm -hmm. yeah. Now with the body cameras, there's, they, their discretion has kind of been eroded because it's all captured. And I think also we're more legalistic. Yeah. You know, everything's a serious offense. Yeah. But with, with Leslie, a lot of the things that I heard about him as emotional stuff had always, it always ties back to his mother, like mm -hmm. his outbursts, his, his reactions, everything, always like his mother was around. Like a lot of, I didn't, I don't remember hearing anything about like when he was at school and his mom's not around where he had an outburst. Mm -hmm. So it seems his mom is very highly, highly charged. Yeah. Trigger person. She was just disgusted him. with him. That's what it sounds like. When you read the things, like just like she treated the other brother like an only child. Mm. He could do no wrong. Yeah. Uh, but Leslie was just, she was just had enough. Mm. And everything he liked was awful. Like yeah. in her in like, her mind, like her girl, or like his girlfriend, yeah. Crystal, right? Chris. Truly, like an adversarial kind of relationship yeah. between the two, yeah, between him and his mom. Yeah, there's a lot of combat. Um, it's like there are a lot of times where a mom doesn't like a daughter or uh, doesn't like a son's girlfriend uh, or, or wife doesn't like the daughter-in-law, mostly because it's like you're trying to take my son from me. And there's kind of the, the adversarial mm -hmm. nature there. In this case, it seemed much more like, oh, you like her? She must be terrible. Right. Mm -hmm. Like, right. Yeah, everything he liked. I think that was the sense. Right. Everything he liked, she just, well, if you like it. Automatically bad. Yeah, it must be bad. Yeah. So apparently, uh, Leslie really liked Crystal. Um, her father was a truck driver. And uh, Opal wasn't happy with that. She looked down on truck drivers, apparently. And they fought and fought, um, but Leslie kept seeing her. And that takes us to Saturday, September 27, 1958. Leslie was going to go see a drive-in. They actually they actually had the movies. Well, I'll we'll go to that later. Was, um, <laughs> it's been a tangent. So it was a no, no, uh, no room for sergeants no room and for the, sergeants. the undead. Undead, yeah. The undead, yeah. Yeah. One, one I think, generally considered a good movie and one... One, well, not so much, but we'll, we'll get to that. So mm -hmm. uh, the, the, his parents had two vehicles. One was a 1957 Mercury, pretty neat car. Uh, I could see why he would have been happy about taking that, but then at the last minute, uh, yeah, they get into this argument. He was told that he was allowed to take mm -hmm. the car, mm -hmm. that he was allowed to go on the state, he was allowed to take his girlfriend to the drive-in. At 16 years old, ooh. Yeah. That would have been it. That's, I mean, that's where yeah. it's at. Yeah. Especially yes, so, Omaha, Nebraska. Like. Not a lot to do in, in 1958 Omaha. I imagine the driving was probably like a big deal. Mm -hmm. you know? I think Andy Griffith was in one of those yep. movies, right? Yep. So, yeah. And Don and, Knotts. Uh, was it the, the no, uh, no Room for Sergeants was, was Andy Griffith? Was it, was it Don Knotts with that too? No, I don't think he was. No. Uh, maybe I'm thinking Andy Griffith's show. Yeah. Mm. But yeah, Andy Griffith's in it. So pretty excited. Yeah. He was a big star. And... Uh, we see that uh, he's talking to Crystal, and you know the way they describe it in the uh, Omaha World Herald was, I just pictured this phone, <laughs> this cord. It was like those coily cords, yeah. 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 just like really, <laughs> it's just really all the way stretched out. out. <laughs> he's like <laughs> just <laughs> closing the door in his room, like right. pulling that phone through, like under the door, and and the mother's probably like, what is this cord? You know, 
He's just twirling the, the, the line on his finger <laughs> while he's tighter talking to and tighter. And pull it. Yeah. So, uh, so she, she gets this confrontation with him and says okay. the crystal was no good. Now, those are pretty serious words back in 1958. Mm-hmm. Yeah. No good. That was, that was a big deal. That was, that was pra- practically cussing about mm-hmm. her. Yeah. It was like then. an expletive. I get it. Yeah. It was, yeah. it was very no much. Good. It's like, no good? No good. <laughs> right? That would be the point in the movie where it'd be like, you know, everyone gasps and, you know, the turning <gasps> the point in the, the movie. The old lady faints. <laughs> right, right, right. <laughs> no good. <laughs> well, I never. Yeah, right. <laughs> The, the, was it a, the uh, pearl clutching? Yeah. yeah. So, uh, no, no, Don Knotts wasn't there. Was he? I thought he was. It Probably because he was in the Andy Griffin show. Right. Right, so, yeah, I thought I remember that. Yeah. Uh, that's really all I've heard of in that movie. Andy Griffin, Don Knotts, a lot of these other guys, that, uh, they look familiar. Yeah. All right, but so we'll, we'll it, get to that. She, per, but uh, Opal called Crystal no good, mm-hmm. and it sparked an uh, argument. I, basically... It sparked the argument. As soon as he said one word back to her, she's like, that's it. You're not taking the car. Mm. Right. And that he blew up on that one because that was his whole thing. Like He was going to go on a date. Yep. And at that point, he punched and put a hole in the wall and then uh, stormed out of the house. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So when he came back in, uh, the, he retrieved a rifle he was familiar with, twenty two caliber Remington semi-automatic. Uh, and we've talked it's a, about... It's a nice rifle. Yeah, it really is. It really is. We've talked about different weapons before. You know, twenty two is such an odd choice for uh, trying to kill somebody. It's not very powerful. It can certainly kill people, and it has killed many. Mm-hmm. But it's just, it's not designed for that. And, you know, one way to overcome that is a headshot. The other way is multiple shots. I, I don't know whether it's a matter of... Like, I think that might have been a matter of that's where what he grabbed first. Or, like, that was what he was able to grab ammunition for first. Maybe that's all they had. I, that might have been the only one they had ammunition for in the house. But, uh, but that's what he grabbed. And he said it was already loaded when he talked to the police. But they found a box of ammo uh, that matched. Yeah. He loaded it. Tossed over the fence. He loaded it. Yeah. Uh, I'm pretty sure he did. I also don't buy his story with the dad, but we'll get to that. So... So this is all his account. We don't know. Mm-hmm. We don't know. We, mm-hmm. we know they were shot six times each, right. but we don't know anything beyond that. So he stand, this is what he says. And this is consistent, I think, with the disgust that Opal had for him. His mother's standing in the doorway between the dining room and the kitchen. I think he was in the dining room, as I understood it, like building a mental image. Right. And she, she laughed at him and said, what are you going to do, shoot me? And then he did mm-hmm. six times. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. He made good on that. Yep. He didn't need words to answer that question. So she screamed in, in pain and fell to the floor. I tend to believe that's true. Mm-hmm. Um, so actually only shot her once. And then he came up right to her and shot her five more mm-hmm. times. And I, the reason I think that's true is that's an unusual thing to confess to. That does not make right. him look good. Right. Yeah. Sure. I would even say he's no good. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my goodness. <laughs> no. Yeah. Uh, he then... He said he he, uh, he realized what he did and he fell to his knees and started apologizing to yeah. her as she was dying. Mm-hmm. Yeah, she probably wasn't but, in any mood but, for forgiveness. No, right I personally, like that part to me seems like he's trying to make himself look good yeah. in that situation because if she's if she really was that big a trigger person for him, if she really treated him with that much disgust and he was really that fed up with her, there's no way he apologized to her. There's no way he did anything but just. Be, feel relieved. Relief, yeah, that's what I would, yeah. In that moment. Yeah. And maybe some excitement because now he knows he's going to get that mercury for the date. But uh, oh, he's got one more obstacle to get there's, the mercury. There's one more. Yeah, yeah so, so, uh, so dad comes in. <laughs> it wasn't his day. No. <laughs> um, I'm pretty sure. I'm pretty sure. The, store, but that was going to be it. Right? I'm mm-hmm. pretty sure that dad coming home was definitely going to be a thing that was going to stop Leslie from getting the mercury. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but I don't think that that was his focus at that moment. Mm-mm. I really don't. I think that the shooting the mom was was just kind of like this is this is it. And we get to the point where the um, domestic violence victims, where you get the, the battered battered spouse syndrome. Like at mm-hmm. a certain point, that's it. Like the, there's a line, and she, he cro- like she crossed it with with him. 
he was done. So he shot her. And then I, th- I don't think he was even thinking about dad coming home until dad was walking through the yeah. door carrying groceries. Right. Yeah. So what probably happened, I think, at this point is Leslie probably let his dad get in a little bit until you could see. I don't know how the house was laid out. There actually was a schematic I saw in some place for the right. house. Um, you know, it wasn't particularly complex design, but you, you had to, I think you had to get in a little bit to see mm-hmm. where she would would be and uh, I think he I think he let her he let him come in and then shot him all six times like rapidly you know because in theory there would be like a physical like there could be a physical confrontation Mm -hmm. Uh, Leslie tells this story where where his dad where his dad uh, said saw uh, Opal and said what have you done and he like tried to attack Leslie Mm -hmm. then he went back to attend to her then he came that's when he got shot I, I don't know if I buy any of that right I can't help but think, in, you know, early in the story in the, in the newspaper, they were talking about um, how the dad was a victim, too, of Opal. He also, I think, got kicked out of the house or wasn't let back in the house or something. Like, mm-hmm. So like, part of me kind of thinks, you know, Bill comes in to the house and he sees, you know, Opal shot. Yeah. And he's like, oh, no, this is awful. What am I going to do now? <laughs> You know, wink, wink over, yeah, over right. at Leslie. <laughs> you know, like, kind of like, don't want to, don't want to seem like I'm happy here, but um, wasn't a huge loss for him. It's possible. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But you know, maybe he was kind of in the cycle of of being manipulated, where he he was like to see somebody who was so cruel right. to him, harm still affected him. Yeah. But I just yeah. there's a part of me that thinks like he was kind of ambivalent. Mm. Yeah, like, it's possible. Uh, yeah. Oh, yeah. oh no, I I can see it, but I also think, like, I honestly do think it was a shock to him. Like, he walks in, sees it. Oh my God, what's going on? And he starts freaking out. Um, the thing that that makes me think that it wasn't just a a, a oh no, Dad's coming at me. He's kind of trying to hurt me. Is because like he had to have reloaded the gun at some mm-hmm. point. Mm-hmm. Yeah, like there, it 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 doesn't take twelve shots. It doesn't hold. It's not that. That's not the capacity of. Yeah, the I don't weapon. know. They never mentioned the magazine capacity, but I would think that, uh, and they don't, they actually didn't even mention the magazine style. So I don't know if that was a tube loader where it could have held more than ten, you know, pretty easily, or it was magazine fed, mm-hmm. like a like a box magazine. Tube is a magazine too, but like a detachable box magazine. Mm-hmm. Most detachable box magazines for those rifles back then probably would have been ten. So even one the tube, he's a he's a round short. Yeah. But I'm I'm wondering if it was or you know one in the chamber, confusing because I'm talking about tube loading right. as well. So box magazine, ten in the magazine, one in the chamber, tube loading, one in the chamber, and you could have like seventeen in the tube depending on how long your barrel is because mm-hmm. the tube runs under like a shotgun. Mm-hmm. So I'm wondering if it wasn't a, a tube loader and it was just you know you pull the you know, pull it apart and drop right. in each cartridge and then. Some of the magazines, though, only have a capacity of like six. That's what I'm thinking. Well, this is a 22, though. Yeah, well, I know, I know, but yeah, some of the, some of those magazines, like the um, oh, the little box magazine, yeah, the little box magazine that, that only has like six. That's a capacity of six. Like it's mm-hmm. it's not very big. You know, if it comes, it, 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 you can get tens. You can also get like 25. You can get like, 100 round drums. Yeah, yeah. You get 100. Yeah, yeah. You get 200 or 500 <laughs> round like <laughs> double drum <laughs> magazines like, like that you can put in. But that's. That's a lot of weight to put underneath <laughs> on that. Yeah, only Rambo that can magazine. hold something like that. Well, no, I'm just talking about for the gun, for the magazine no, release. Yeah. It's just a little little lever. Like, yeah, yeah, it's got a whole lot of weight to a lot of weight underneath it there. But uh, <laughs> the 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 little the little magazine, the little small little box magazine that usually is flush with the right. I think right. that would only hold about six. So if that was the case, again, I don't know the exact model of it. Um, just that it was a 22, yeah. or it was a Remington 22 or Winchester. It was a Remington. Remington. Yeah. yeah. So I don't know exact what the exact model of it, so I don't know what the capacity, capacity was, but if it used one of the small magazines, it would make sense that it was six in mom and six in dad because it was the same size magazine. Right. So he switched And at that, that point, magazine. he had to either switch out magazines, or if he only had one magazine, he had to reload the rounds in that magazine. Either way, he likely had to reload. It's just to put six rounds. If you've got 14 rounds in a tube... And you put six in a mom. Why are you going to only put exactly like, six? You just keep firing into dad. Yeah. You just keep keep firing, yeah. um, or you just keep firing into mom because because of the rage. Uh, it, yeah. it seems likely he emptied it 
each time. Mm -hmm. uh, but that means that he had to have reloaded before dad came in. Yeah, I wish they had specified what Remington model it was. Uh, <clears throat> so it gives us an idea of whether it's telling the truth or not. But I'm assuming yeah. he was lying about part of it. Mm -hmm. that's, that's kind it's, of... It's a good assumption, especially since, you know, it's natural human instinct to deflect as much as possible. Mm -hmm. And he was 16, and he was probably... The, the rage and the <clears throat> everything else he was feeling at that moment probably didn't remember everything exactly as it happened. Just his perception of it in that mindset, whatever he was feeling at the time, which I can't even imagine. You know, you just did that, or you're about to do that, and you're feeling all that rage, and you know, yeah. he probably doesn't remember all of it exactly how it happened anyway. And I can think that if if they normally kept the gun loaded with a short magazine after he shot mom, he would reload it so that he could put it back the way it was stored. Mm -hmm. That's a reasonable explanation for why it was reloaded and how it could fit into his narrative of dad comes through the door, freaks out, comes after him, so he just grabs the gun and unloads. But regardless, that's what you know. That's what ended up happening is he kills mom, then dad comes home and he kills dad. Mm -hmm. Whether it was him, you know, deer hunter style, sitting sitting in the, the back corner in the shadows, right? With the gun just waiting. <laughs> the barrel comes out into the, the light. barrel comes out of the light. And dad comes, <laughs> comes in. Oh no! Drops the groceries and then blam, 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 blam. And he yeah. goes down. Of course, that's the big cinematic version, right? Because um, we have to, you have to use the big sound effects, even though it's a twenty-two, which would just be like, it's, it's just like a shotgun, it's like he's right. got a Mossberg five hundred. Right. <laughs> you even hear it rack, him rack on the slide. Right. Shh. Uh, uh, yeah. So uh, it's interesting because. I, they never really specified how long it was between the shootings. Mm -hmm. But, you know, Leslie had some options here. Yeah. I mean, he could have he could have uh, put the rifle away. The technology for matching firearms was very primitive in 1958. He could have cleaned it, put it away. Oh, and that, at that point, the tw matching 22s was almost impossible. Because if it's, uh, cause it's, a, uh, it's not a center fire. Right, the rim fire. Yeah, it's yeah. a rim fire. So, so he, he could have disposed of all the cartridges. Mm-hmm. Right, all the spent brass, uh, cleaned the rifle, put it away, and like I was outside and I heard gunshots, or I was down the street right. playing with friends, and you know came back and it was and quiet they, in here. They didn't have GSR tests for. He could he could have washed up anyway, but mm -hmm. yeah, they, they, you know, forensically, I mean, it was a pretty primitive time. Ultimately, 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 he was able to move the move his parents' bodies into the basement, right, and rolled up the carpet. <laughs> Cleaned and up the scene reasonably well. Yeah, cleaned up the scene reasonably well. Uh, so yeah. that it wasn't immediately obvious. Yeah. As a 16-year-old, I'm sure that he would have perhaps had a bit more believability than maybe if he was an adult and said, oh, I came back and I just found them like this. But as a 16-year-old, maybe he would have been believed a little bit more. Like, oh, 16-year-olds don't kill their parents that often. R rarely ever. So maybe they would have believed him more. Yeah. Curious, though, that he did what he did after that. Yeah, I, I would think in terms of escaping responsibility, uh, either either make the gun disappear if you don't have time to to fool around with it and leave. Uh, actually, that would probably be the best option, right? Just just gun gone or or cleaned and get out of there, and then let somebody else find the I body. Instead, he really doubled I, down. I think he was trying to. I do think he was trying to cover his tracks. So I think he panicked. I was like, oh, crap, what did I do? Oh, shit. Um, let, let's hide as much as we can. Mm -hmm. And that's the only thing. He was hiding as much as he could. And then it was, I can't deal with this anymore. Let me, let me, get, let me go. So he went, he went and took the mercury, picked up Crystal, and they went to the movie. Well, yeah, so first he called, he called a, f a friend and, and took care of his brother. And that was the story of Wyoming. Yeah. So he set that up. Yeah, and then he... Yeah, call, call, calls a neighbor Rose and is like, hey, can you pick up my brother? Because my parents had to leave suddenly. Mm -hmm. You know, Grandpa took a train. <laughs> He's senile. He got off the train, so they can't find him. So they went to go see if they could find him. They took the train out of, you know, so and such, such and such, such and such a time. Mm -hmm. Like he gave, it's a, he put a lot of detail mm -hmm. into that story yeah. real quick because he gave date and time of the train, which would be important later. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, so he, he did, uh, he really wanted to see those movies, <laughs> right? Most important thing to him. Yeah, right. cinema. 
I, th- I think that was a spite move. I really do. I think I'm going see to see the movie, movie yeah. was a spite movie. I think he, he was the rage was there. That's why he killed mom. Dad was kind of a secondary thing. Uh, and he went to the movie because mom said no. Mm-hmm. So, well, I'm going. Yeah. I don't care. I'm going. It was a sticking point on him at that mm-hmm. point. It was it was a point of of not like it wasn't a super petty. Like everybody talks about this. Like, oh, he killed his parents. So he could take his girlfriend on a date. It's like, it, it's not that simple. It wasn't just, oh, I want to go on, on a date. You can't go. Die. <laughs> yep. Yep. It was, it was much, more, much more emotionally charged than that. And the going point was, well, I did this, so I'm going. And like, he went. they went on the date. Mm-hmm. I think also, I mean, I don't think he thought about this, but it, it would look kind of suspicious if he didn't go on the, the date. That's true. Because he already told people his parents were gone. Mm-hmm. Right. So it makes it look like he was taking time to clean up. But, yeah, so they saw Double Feature, right? They saw um, No Time for Sergeants and, and Undead. I think Undead was shot in a converted supermarket. Apparently it was pretty bad. Pretty bad. Uh, well, but a it, lot, you know, a it, lot wasn't, people... it wasn't the 1950s version of Cocaine Bear. <laughs> That's right. Starring Jeff Pinson as the uh, bear. A lot of people like No Time for Sergeants, so that was a popular movie. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So the next day, Leslie uh, walked over to a neighbor and asked for a shovel and got to work in the backyard, yep. uh, not too far from a tree, buried uh, his parents. A lot of, I imagine, physical exertion here because mm-hmm. yeah. he had put them in the basement. Yeah. yeah. And this didn't, the house didn't look like a walkout. You can't tell. It didn't look like a walkout. Right. So you're going back up them steps. Uh-huh. Yeah. Clunk, well, clunk, clunk, clunk all the way up. He had to, to take a belt and wrapped around his his dad's feet and use that as a kind of a handle to mm-hmm. help haul his dad out um, into the, into the hole that he, he dug, mm-hmm. um, which wasn't super deep, Mm-mm. but it was deep enough because he went back and got his mom, put her on top of him and then covered him up. Yep. Yeah. I imagine it looked pretty obvious. Yeah. If you were in the yard. Yeah. Yeah, it was, it's funny. I, it wasn't though because it was an azalea bush. It, it was it was low to the ground and it covered a larger area. So he kind of was underneath that digging, and digging out. And so once they were in and the co- and covered, the bush kind of was over top. Of, over it was kind of flopped over. Yeah. So it wasn't super obvious until you move the bush and then oh look, there's a grave. It's a fresh grave, <laughs> right? Mm. Yeah. So then on oh, so this was Sunday, he buried his parents. Monday, he goes to the business, he opens it, uh, and, and then his brother Jim comes back a few days later, never suspected anything. That's, that's a good clean job, because you figure there's blood everywhere. Yeah. Everywhere. Right. Right. Down the basement steps, mm-hmm. in the basement, in the dining room, in the kitchen. So. Didn't notice anything. Yeah. 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 Was, well, his brother also didn't notice that the uh, carpet in the, or the, the rug in the dining room was gone. Yeah. But it, he'd, he'd gotten rid of that. Mm-hmm. It's curious, right? Uh, 1957 Mercury has a pretty substantial trunk, if I remember right. Mm -hmm. You know, he had access to the vehicle. Yeah. Nebraska, there's nothing there. You you, you drive an hour outside Omaha, you can be, (laughs) you know, you'd be in a field where no one's going to ever find you. Right. Uh, Even a half hour. Why not uh, load the bodies in the the Mercury? Doesn't make much sense. You could clearly pick them up or, or... Get them yeah. many places. Yeah, yeah. I don't know. Move up the basement steps. He can get them into the, the trunk of the Mercury. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Seems I think he odd. was just trying to not ruffle too much, right? If he left with the Mercury and was gone for a couple of days because he's out burying his parents in the middle of a cornfield somewhere, people are going to notice. Yeah, I don't think it would have taken him that long at night. And, there, and you know, back then, like, there's <laughs> hardly any traffic. I mean, he could have gone somewhere where... No one would have ever found him. Yeah. Even probably to the modern age mm-hmm. would have found him. That's true. You've got to dig true. a little deeper, though. Right? Yeah. Shallow go, graves. Got to go a little bit further. Yeah, down. the animals can get right in there. So you don't want that. But yeah, when, when his, you know, it was uh, October 5th, um, his grandparents come into town. And the neighbor starts to suspect. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Something's <laughs> wrong. Something's <here>. wrong. <laughs> yeah. She called the police. Yeah. And I think the... Grandparents also did. Yeah. 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 They were, yeah. They were thinking, they're, they're missing. Yeah. 
Let's call the police. Mm. Yep. So uh, Leslie was interviewed and uh, immediately confessed. Immediately. Yeah. All that work. Did mm. you do it? Yeah. Wow, this was easy. <laughs> <laughs> Usually they put up more of a fight. Yep. That was it. So then they have this photo in the in the newspaper where, right. you know, again, it just seems like such a small backyard. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, it's like all these cops right, right over there. Yeah, pointing yeah. to it. So they, it's, they found him. It's wild to think about his mindset at that point. Not only committing the murder, getting the anger at that point and, and all the adrenaline, whatever he must have been feeling, but then his mindset after that too. Let me, let me uh, create this elaborate story about my parents going, and I'm going to go to the movies, and then I'm going to bury them, and I'm going to open Dad's business, and I'm going to try to make things look as normal as possible. Jim's going to come back uh, after being with a family friend. And if, I don't know. I mean, he must have thought, all right, I got away with it. But then, you, like, you know, he couldn't live that forever as a 16-year-old, and especially with his brother, too. Somebody was going to catch on to him, but he created such an elaborate story. It's, it's amazing to think somebody 16 years old, or anybody, for that matter, at any age, could have concocted that kind of, that level of deception mm -hmm. and got away with it for so long, especially a 16-year-old. I, I, to me, it seems a lot like he was going off of just impulse. Like the impulse was, oh, I see a detail. I've got to deal with this. Mm -hmm. It's a very ADHD thing to me. Like, there's a detail. Oh, there's my brother. Oh, I got to do something about that. There comes the lie about where the parents went. Uh, like, oh, you know what? And the, the, the whole sticking point, I'm going to see this movie. So he goes to see the movie, and then everything after that is like, oh, crap. I probably got to do something about this. Mm -hmm. And it was like, yeah, trying to trying to hide it, trying to cover it up. I don't think he ever thought that he actually got away with it. Yeah, that's I fair. think he was just like, I'm just going to keep going until, some, until something happens. If nothing ever happens, no. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Oh, well, but he had a lot of, he did have a lot of will on it, though. Yeah. Like, he was like, I'm going to, like, I'm just going to keep going until somebody calls me on this. Mm -hmm. If nobody ever called him on it, he just kept going. Mm -hmm. yeah. That um, seems to be his style. Yeah. yeah. So, but yeah, he, he confessed immediately. As soon as somebody called him on it, <laughs> he's like, well, there's no use hiding it. <laughs> yeah, I killed him. Yep, there's yep. the bodies. They're, yes. they're over there under the azalea bush, like. Yeah, so he was facing uh, two counts of first degree murder, so that would be yeah. life in prison. I think that's because in the um, in the interview when he confessed, one of the things he told the, the officer was that after he put the hole, punched the hole in the wall, he went outside and he said, "That's when I decided I was going to end it." Mm -hmm. um, and then he went back in and grabbed the rifle. So that's why they were going with first degree. It's like, yeah. okay, that's premeditated. Mm -hmm. And then I think they they thought the same thing for the dad. It was like he he re, he had to have reloaded. Yeah, it was that first makes it pre, that makes it premeditated. Yeah. So that's, there's first degree. So so these days, uh, he was 16. Uh, these days, I think what would happen to somebody like him probably be you know convicted on first, no plea bargain. They would just take it to trial. They had enough. They would just spend the taxpayer's money and go the whole way. You know, no plea, no plea bargain. And life in prison without the possibility of parole, of course, being 16, you have the Supreme Court decision where, you know, they don't, they don't like to keep you in with no hope of parole. Mm -hmm. But then it's a double murder, right? So if it's like, say, 40 years each, it's going to work out the same. It's going to be in prison for life. Right. But I think realistically he would have died in prison these days, is what mm -hmm. I'm saying. There yeah. was a chance he could have got out for a single murder. But for a double murder, especially a parasite... Mm -hmm. Yeah, I don't, I don't, I don't see modern society being quite so accepting, mm -hmm. and, and I'm really surprised. Even in 1958, yeah, kind of like the attitude here. So, in June of of 1959, he was offered, well, he pleaded guilty to two counts of second degree. He was offered a deal, life in prison. I don't know. I kind of disagree on that point because 95 percent of cases are so, are are convictions through plea deal. Even today, I, I, I see prosecutors like, okay, second degree. I don't know. Two counts of second degree. We'll do life. I don't know. These, well, I don't, maybe in, I don't know, maybe in Nebraska. I think in Delaware, you know, there's a lot of states here in the East. I'm pretty sure he, they would have just gone for the first degree. Shooting the parents. Yeah. I don't know. I, I think they would have just spent the money. Uh, but, you know, second degree murder in most places is 25 to life, somewhere in there. So 
with the double, maybe they figure 50 years. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I don't know. I would be inclined. I think about like from society's point of view, just just to have the trial, especially when you have a mountain of evidence. I think in 58, it was still a big deal to try a 16 year old as an adult. That could have been a factor too. Yeah. So, yeah. I mean, like there, there's the chance that, I, I think that, especially in, in, at that point, the prosecutor would be like, okay, well, if we're, they're letting us get away with trying them as an adult, we'll go with a second degree because mm -hmm. if it's challenged and then they decide, oh no, you, he was under 18, you couldn't mm -hmm. have charged him with that, then the whole thing's gone anyway. It might've been sympathy. He, he also looked kind of innocent. He or, looked 12. Yeah. <laughs> if you look at the, yeah. at the, the mugshot picture, I, I don't believe he was 16. Like just looking at him. Yeah, and then you he know, had, he had big ears, mm -hmm. but the and over, just like the, it looked he looked like he had to, still had growing to do to get into his ears, <laughs> and so it made him look a lot younger than than that. So that's probably a, probably a part of it. A part of it. Maybe the overbearing mother was factored in too. You know, maybe they thought there'd be some sympathy, yeah. like he had a reason. If we take it to if we take it to trial, <laughs> this twelve year old looking sixteen year old is going to say my mama was terrible to me, and anybody who was on that jury who's got a terrible mother is going to be sympathetic towards yeah. him, and he could be he could be acquitted, uh, yeah, or maybe a hung jury. Like it would just be complex. So yeah, maybe they thought, right. let's just finish the case. Yeah. So he was sentenced to life in prison, but in Nebraska at that time. That meant something very different mm. uh, because the State Board of Pardons was very liberal at that time. Surprisingly yeah. so. I, right. I was really, you know, I've seen a lot of cases and, and... Yeah, they liked to put year limits on life. Yeah. yeah. Surprisingly low, low time <laughs> as well. Yeah, what they would do is they would commute these, these sentences. So mm -hmm. like you were, you were in for life, but it was kind of like wink, wink. Yeah. Nudge, nudge, like, you know. It's like you're in gonna, for life, but we're, we're going to define life as 30 years. <laughs> yeah. Well, they, I mean, he only needed to serve 10 and yeah, to be eligible for this commutation. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, and then you had this juxtaposition with Charles Starkweather, who was executed two weeks after uh, Leslie went into prison. And, and this is somebody that, that Nebraska had no sympathy for. Yeah, right. There's a completely different type of killer. Um, he inspired the movie Natural Born Killers. Uh, incredible case. Um, it's just it's just crazy that it ends in that same place as Leslie. Like Leslie's coming in, right? And that's when and they starts going out. Yeah, yeah so brothers going, going out. out. Yeah. Yep, he was very successful in prison. Model prisoner. Mm -hmm. Yeah, model prisoner. Might have been that execution two weeks in. Like, mm, you know what? Scared him into that. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> it also might have been wow. My mom's not here. Mm -hmm. Maybe. Different I, life for him. As, as I said, four walls do not a prison make. I think he felt more in prison with his mom than he did in actual prison. But he did make a lot of connections, friends. He knew people. Mm -hmm. Yeah, everybody, uh, he had a few disciplinary hiccups, but everybody in the prison pretty much liked him. Mm -hmm. And even the prosecutor, when he was, he pleaded guilty, was like, oh, don't worry, son, it's not gonna be for life. Even he knew. Yeah. Uh, but everybody in the prison just assumed this guy would do his time mm -hmm. and and the Board of Pardons would mm -hmm. would hand down commutation. Yeah. Yeah. And they figured it would be after ten years. Mm -hmm. After ten years mm -hmm. he'll be able to get out. And like they 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 all knew. Like everybody was telling him that. But he tried to appeal mm -hmm. the convictions because uh they said ineffective counsel, that he didn't understand what the charges really were, that he was pressured into it because he was in holding for eight months prior to giving the plea. And, uh, and ultimately, uh, his, his uh, appeals were denied. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, Inter he... Interesting side note on that. While he was in eight months in holding, um, he because he was under 18, custody was given to his girlfriend's parents. So, <laughs> yeah, he also. Was, he was technically, you know, under under you know the parental guardianship of his girlfriend's dad. Yeah, while in while, incarcerated. While he was incarcerated. Mm -hmm. They also never took a second picture of him. Yeah, no. <laughs> so so uh, he decided to escape. Which, which actually changed in Nebraska law right. afterwards. <laughs> like, like they'd be like, you got to take regular pictures of these guys. 
Mostly because of the escaping part. Yeah. <laughs> Mostly because of the escaping part. Yeah, because it was, was eight years. Eight years after he was, he went in. He looked completely different. Looked mm-hmm. completely different because he went in at sixteen years old. He was twenty four. He'd grown up a lot, mm-hmm. but they didn't take any picture of him at twenty four. Yeah. So the only picture they had to put out after an escape was <laughs> when he was sixteen. Yep. Um, have you seen this boy? Uh, yeah, maybe eight years ago. Eight years ago, <laughs> picture yeah. a bit older. <laughs> So, uh, so he he became friends with the with the guy who who killed a man in a I think it was in a robbery, uh, yeah. Jim Harding, mm-hmm. and and uh, Jim Harding uh, looked a lot like James Earl Ray. We'll get to that. It mm-hmm. Didn't didn't help him, but the uh, the guy who killed Martin Luther King Jr. Right. So so Jim Harding conspired with uh, with Les, and then a guy who was recently paroled. I find this interesting. Like you you get, you get released on parole, and they're like. You're not going to commit any more crimes, right? No, of course. I'm not going to no, commit no. any more crimes. Yeah, no. I'm done with, <laughs> done with <laughs> that. So, anybody know some crimes I can do? <laughs> Let me just go commit some crimes right here. <laughs> See you guys later. Before you know it, you're buying a cardboard tube and shoving hacksaw blades and masks <laughs> in it. Yeah. And that's what he did. He threw them over the, the prison wall. Now, by this time... Oh, well, he did personalized delivery of masks? Oh, man. There you go. Jeez. So lucky that he got lucky. that gig. Oh, Damn. God. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Wasn't even near Halloween. Eh? <laughs> Jeez. Well, there you go. <sighs> I so, missed my calling. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, we see that uh, Les went to the, the fence. Apparently, he was moved to a lower security building. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it was a dorm outside the main building. Where he and, and Jim were both housed because they were good behavior. Mm-hmm. I think it was Jim who went for the walk around the perimeter oh, fence he? He got and it. got the, the, the tube. Um, and yeah, they went into the music room where they spent a lot of time. Mm-hmm. They knew it very well. They knew it very well. They spent a lot of time in there. So it wasn't unusual that they spent a lot of time in there. So right. the, the guards were, were not alerted because, hey, Les and Jim are spending a lot of time in the music room. They're always in the music room. Oh. Okay, yeah. but they spent their time in there using those hacksaw blades to, 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 to cut through the bars on the mm-hmm. window and disguising it in between so they don't nobody notice it. Right, right. Yeah. And then they held the bars in place with chewing gum. Yeah. <laughs> when it was time to go to meal and then bed, chewing gum. Mm-hmm. But the important part was that it was in the dorm, so that it wasn't in cells. Right. Like, like you think about the, the escape from Alcatraz. Like they're in their individual cells, and they had to tunnel through the walls to get out, mm-hmm. get up into the other the other room. This was just a big, open dorm. Like the beds were just there, and they didn't have to, to do to go anywhere. Right. Yeah, and once they once they had the bars completely cut, they just yeah, you know, imagine they just set it there, uh, with the gum, and just waited for their chance. Yeah. Um, so the parolee, <clears throat> again, not committing any crimes, uh, pulls up. To the fence, near the fence. Yeah, he was in, in a, um, just on the other side of a copse of trees, about 150 yards from the fence line of the, of the, uh. Yep. So they climbed over the fence. There was a, yeah. uh, guard tower and they just hoped he didn't look. They, mm. they took the masks and they put it in a bed. This was escape from Alcatraz, right? Yeah. They took the masks, put it in the fence or in, in their beds and then piled a bunch of, uh, other blankets and sheets and stuff underneath the, the stuff so that when the guards came in and shined around, they mm-hmm. could count heads. Right. right. Um, it's funny, Jim Harding, even they, they were unflinched by the, the mask. One of them was a Groucho Marx mask. <laughs> so that big bushy mustache and Jim Harding just took some scissors and cut the, the, the mustache down some. And then they just kind of shoved it underneath there, filled them up with, uh, with stuff too, so that they were inflated. Mm-hmm. And interestingly enough, those masks were never found. And they weren't, weren't found. Like it, it fooled the guards on their first couple of rounds. Mm-hmm. But then supposedly other inmates who knew what was going on, they grabbed and disposed of the stuff before. It helped them out. Helped them out. Yeah. That, that bought them a lot more time. It did. Like, so, uh, so Leslie called a friend of his uh, who actually was interviewed for for the uh, newspaper Mm -hmm. and uh, he helped him take a bus to Chicago. (laughs) Well, initially it was going to be a train. They went to the train station. 
but then the next train wasn't leaving for six hours. Mm -hmm. And this was, what, midnight? They were getting nervous. And they were getting nervous. Yeah. So they went to the bus station and got bus to Chicago. They arrived in Chicago at noon the next day, but they it was discovered that they were missing at 7 a.m. Mm -hmm. But they'd left out of there at like 10, mm -hmm. <laughs> jumped the fence, like threw a jacket over the barbed wire, whew, right over the fence, yep. took off running. They got lucky that the guy in the guard tower wasn't looking in their direction yeah. because it was brightly lit. <laughs> yeah, and they probably would have been shot. Yeah. Right? Yeah, they probably would have been shot. And I imagine uh, in post-World War II America, those uh, guards were probably like, you know, carrying M1 Grand or something pretty hefty, yeah. like military surplus. Yeah. You know, goes, yeah. to, goes to those underfunded agencies. And, yeah. And uh, yeah, they, it would have been it would have been bad for them. Mm. Uh, but the guard didn't look, and no. they made it. And Leslie potentially only had two more years left in prison yeah. before he potentially could have had the sentence commuted or out on parole or something, whatever might have happened. As a model prisoner, he might have had a good chance of getting out after those 10 years, but eight years had passed, and I guess he was done with it, and I don't want to do those last two years. Again, I'm on seems, my way out. Seems like, even though it's planned out and brilliantly executed, it seems like one of those impulsive decisions. Mm -hmm. Just like, hey, you want to break out? Yeah. Saw an opportunity and took <laughs> yeah, it. Yeah, I do. <laughs> like, yeah. do you really? Not really. Like, if you'd been asked a second time, you sure you want to do this? I'm like, you know what? I don't really want to now. Like, we got a concert next week. <laughs> I kind of want to play <laughs> in the concert. But being criminals and everything in prison yeah. and, and convicts, the, the question of do you still want to escape, you kind of answer yes no matter what. That is the thing to once, say. Once you're in on that plan, you're in. There is no backing out. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so. Unless your intent is to turn over the person for trying to escape, but that's an entirely different story <laughs> than an entirely different serial killer. Maybe that maybe he could have got a sentence commuted early by turning <laughs> into Jim Harding. That's true. Potentially. But no, yeah, he, he decided to go out with him. So at this point in the story, uh, Leslie just goes dark, right? He's, <clears throat> he's off the grid. And Jim Harding was also in Chicago, and you know, it was this kind of awkward meeting between them. Um, where I just kind of picture less like, well, it's been fun, but we should probably not hang out anymore. <laughs> so it's been fun, but I got a job and I got a girl and I don't need you anymore. Yeah. <laughs> Later. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. <laughs> Bye. <laughs> so, you know, Jim took the hint and uh, he went to Los Angeles and uh, it was in a bar in May of 1968, and a woman saw him and thought he looked a lot like James Earl Ray, who at that time was on the run after yeah. killing Martin Luther King Jr. Mm. Talk about bad luck for yeah, Jim Harley. Really. Yeah. It's like, this guy, James Earl Ray's over here. Hey, hey look, I'm not James Earl Ray. I'm Jim Harding, an escaped prisoner. <laughs> oh. <laughs> ah, shouldn't have said shouldn't that. Shouldn't have said that part. <laughs> I said the quiet part out loud. <laughs> yeah, so they, they arrested uh, Jim, and then they discovered that uh, he had escaped. It's curious that they just didn't let him go because you knew they had to realize he wasn't James Earl Ray pretty early mm -hmm. on. Yeah, but then, like, they realized it was, wasn't James Earl Ray, but they also needed to verify. So, hey, let's run his fingerprints. Yeah. I don't know. It I mean, not, for him. And it would have taken a while to do that because it wasn't like they had a computer database. And yeah. <laughs> yeah. And it, it would have just been like, yeah, let's see, what's your, what's your actual name? I'm surprised. I'm still surprised they just didn't let him go. Mm -hmm. <clears> that <throat> they actually did the full check. These days, you know, of course they would. Right. But much easier. Yeah. yeah. You know, he went back to prison. Um, he served eight more years and the State Board of Pardons commuted his sentence. <laughs> and he moved, I think it said somewhere in the Pacific Northwest, and had some decent job for a long time and then died of cancer in 2008. It's incredible yeah. that he still got released early. Like, oh, you escaped from prison? We're going to treat you the same Wait, as anybody so else. So you killed a dude, <laughs> and then you escaped from prison. And you look like James Earl Ray. And you look like James Earl Ray. That's punishment in and of itself, don't you think? Like, okay, yeah, let yeah, it Yeah, you're go. right. You've done your time. You look a certain way. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So uh, Leslie had better luck. Uh, <clears throat> the story ends there. Yeah. 
right? As far as the Nebraska prison system was concerned until right. 2022. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. People had all kinds of theories. I find it interesting. Most people believed that he was still alive. Right? There wasn't a lot of people who thought he was yeah. he was going. And they thought he was in Brazil. Yeah. Well, interestingly, there was some evidence behind that. Mm -hmm. Like there was somebody who put in a who was actually like filed a an expat card like for citizenship using the name William Leslie Arnold. Exact birth date, mm -hmm. exact place of birth, Omaha, Nebraska. Uh, in the 1960s, mm -hmm. in 60, I think it was 69, something like that. Uh, so there was there was some evidence, but there was never anybody who paid taxes under that name in Brazil. If you look back at the tax, the Brazilians, they did look back under the tax uh, information. Nobody under that name ever paid taxes in Brazil. Mm -mm. So. It would have been surprising if he used if he was in Brazil if he actually used that name. Obviously, he knew that that would draw some attention, maybe by somebody. Or he already had anyway. a different name. We learned later. Right, he had his his uh, fake name, yeah. the Illinois yeah. birth certificate and, he forged. And we knew that he was living. Uh, when we now know he was living in Chicago at the time that that was mm -hmm. put in in Brazil. Yeah, yeah. And I personally think that he 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 learned a few things when he was in prison. And I don't think that he learned how to forge documents in prison. I just think he learned who he could go to to forge documents. And I think that person could have hooked him up with somebody who was willing to just go down to Brazil yeah, maybe. and put this card in because mm -hmm. that's a red herring right there. Mm -hmm. And if we know, if we've seen anything about him, he was good at laying tracks. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So they never really talked about how he forged the birth certificate. But you know, one common tactic it was very easy back then would be go to a graveyard and find uh, someone who died under a year old. Mm. Uh, that tactic worked as recently as like the 70s and 80s. Those mm -hmm. people did that. Um, that could be one way. But I think in the 50s, it was probably even easier than that. Sure. Yeah. So yeah, he had a birth certificate. So then we, we see in 2022, a man in Australia uploaded DNA to a website. And a U.S. Marshal from Omaha contacted him and had a big, long story for him. <laughs> Very well, the, surprising story. The U.S. Marshal had actually in 2020 had gone to um, Jim Arnold, Leslie's brother, said, hey, can I have some of your DNA put in this database so that we can try and find your brother if his DNA is put in any database? And, his, and Jim Arnold was like, oh, yeah, sure. All right. Gave his DNA freely. Um, but Jim also said, he's like, I think he's dead. Mm -hmm. And uh, he kind of wanted it that way. Yeah. I think Jim Arnold kind of wanted it. He didn't want to see his brother again. He's like, I learned to forgive him a long time ago, but I just, I don't want him back in my life. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, he did murder both his parents. Yeah. yeah. It's a pretty big deal. Yeah. It, it is a, it is a pre pretty big deal. And I can understand why he'd want it that way. Mm -hmm. He was right though. Uh, At that point, yeah. 2020, yeah, he was right. Leslie was dead. So uh, then, you know, at this point, this was the man in Australia, of course, was Leslie's son, which no one knew of, even existed. Right. Yeah. Um, and this whole story unfolded <laughs> where Leslie married a woman in Chicago. She had four, I think it was daughters. Mm -hmm. And he changed his name, John Vincent Damon. And he was a traveling salesman, very successful, yeah. international traveling mm -hmm. salesman. And he did a lot of uh, he did a lot for that family because they were when he met her, she was kind of her last name was Bouvier, <laughs> just like the Simpsons. Just like the Simpsons, yeah. <laughs> I don't remember where her first name was. It wasn't Marge. That no, would have been wasn't Marge. Been two on the nose. And another uh, point for the Simpsons counter down the rear. Um, <laughs> but Bouvier, um, but she they were living just on the poverty line, like or, or like just under. Yeah, and. Uh, he started working and bringing in money and actually raised them up out of the poverty level and brought them into kind of a middle class area. Yeah. And they, they moved around a couple of times. I think she knew. I think, think so? She knew, yeah. Yeah, I yeah. think she knew. Whether she, whether she knew or not, I, I think she knew something. I'm not yeah. sure whether she knew that he was this. Yeah, William Leslie yeah, Arnold. Leslie but, Arnold. But, but yeah, she yeah. knew there was a secret. That, she mm. knew there was a secret, but she she was fine with it because he was a pro good provider. Mm -hmm. yeah. Um, mm -hmm. apparently he was not a great dad at that point. 
uh, according to the stepdaughters, who mm-hmm. kind of said that he was he was very gruff and um, rigid, very rigid. rigid. Yeah, kind of. But I mean, think about who his his only real parenting role model was. Right, right. Like if if his dad was being treated the same way he was, his dad was was more of a confederate than mm-hmm. or an enabler than a parent. So his only parental role model is his mom. So mm-hmm. he kind of takes after her, but he's trying not to be as bad as her, as her. Mm-hmm. but it's still like, like I tell you what to do and you do it. Very rigid, very, very uh, setback. I mean, he wasn't very, he wasn't like engaged with them. Mm-hmm. You have to be very intentional about <clears throat> if you want to change something about how you were taught to parent by your parents, you have to be very intentional about doing that. Otherwise, you and it's very likely that you're going to do the same habits, uh, engage in the same habits that your parents engaged in when you become a parent. And it only makes sense that he would just follow the example that was set by him, perhaps unintentionally. But he also had been in prison for a while and been on the run uh, for some time there. And uh, his life was pretty weird at that point. And then all of a sudden... You know, was involved with this woman and has kids and all that. His life took a very different direction from just being in prison. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean, we do when it comes to our parents. We learn everything about how to be people from our parents That's from right. an early yeah. age. And I, I, I've told people uh, in my work a lot, like if when we become parents, when we get into that the the place where we were as an as adults, where our parents were when we were kids, we either have learned to do things from them and just do them automatically, or we've seen them do things and we said, I never want to be like that. Mm-hmm. And we don't do those things. Um, but unless we actually make that choice, like I don't want to do that. We're just going to end up doing things the way they did. Because and they even still little... usually end up doing things like them. And then uh, I knew I, I told myself I didn't want to do that. And yeah, it's, yeah. it's tough to change yeah. patterns like that. that you've grown yeah. up with. Yeah. Cause we grew up with those patterns. Right. Sometimes we're doing the things without even realizing that we're doing them. That's true. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Well, I think Leslie was also paranoid. Yeah. And um, I think he was really concerned about getting caught. Mm. You know, yeah. probably alternated. He probably was comfortable for a few years. Yeah. Then like anxiety ridden right. for a while. Right. Probably right. ebbed and flowed. Yeah. I think there were probably times where he was... I'm going to have to hit, I'm going to have to run mm-hmm. at any moment. So I don't want to get too close to the kids. Mm-hmm. So he kind of like got gruff with them and, and got like kind of keep them at arm's length. Mm-hmm. But then there were other times where he would kind of <sighs> cool down. Like, especially like they moved to Miami at one point. Mm-hmm. One of the anecdotes from one of his daughters was he set up this who like music uh, set up in his house. And like, because he still liked to play music, mm-hmm. really was into into that. Um, and that was one of the fond memories she had because that was when he was kind of alive and, and had passion and, and sh- showed feeling and connection. And then there were other times where he just was like, nope, shut down, walled off. Yeah. So well, thank you. You get comfortable after you've just moved th- a thousand some miles away from... From where you used to be. So, you know, they're not on to me here. They can't be. So I'm just going to relax a little bit. <laughs> yeah, 1969, moved to Cincinnati. 1971, moved to Miami. <clears throat> Became estranged from his wife in the 70s. In 1977, he moved to Los Angeles, and he filed for divorce when he was there. I think this is uh, probably a stage where he was feeling kind of strong and confident as opposed to paranoid. Yeah. Because, you know, again, I'm... I have a feeling his wife knew, and he probably said something like, all right, look, we're not going to be together, but we don't have to go run into the police about it, Mm -hmm. (laughs) right? So uh, he remarried in 1983, had a daughter in 1986 and a son. This would be the same son who uploaded the DNA in 1991. That's when he had the son. Uh, In 1992, I think the paranoia came back. Mm. Uh, You know, I was trying to think what was happening in 1992, and probably even before this, right? We saw like Unsolved Mysteries. Yeah, right. And there was more interest in, in true crime shows. Right. It was like more true crime documentary style TV shows and things. Focus on the bad guys. Yeah, I'm trying to think like when America's Most Wanted would have been on the scene. Somewhere around that yeah. time period. So I wonder if he was just kind of looking at like 
that plus the DNA had improved right, right. drastically right. from say the mid '80s to the early '90s, yeah. and it would it would improve even more, you know, throughout the you know, this time. But uh, fingerprinting really dialed in, even more so. Mm-hmm. Um, the world was becoming kind of smaller, more connected. This is yeah. before the internet would be kind of out there, but right. I think yeah. America's most wanted started in 1988. Yeah. Right. So, you know, four years. Yeah. Right. Of, of seeing that show and like, right. we're going to get this bad guy. And right, could more, be the next bad guy. more news coverage of things like that, mm-hmm. it, that they maybe found more people using these, these new techniques, these new devices, these new uh, avenues of connecting people to crimes. And you figure four years into that show, they probably already had a list of people that were caught. Yeah. From mm-hmm. the show. There you go. A growing list. I mm-hmm. kind of, th- I kind of think it would have taken something incredibly small for him to suddenly start really, really being radar up again. Mm-hmm. Uh, speeding ticket, mm-hmm. parking ticket, where somebody, where he came across somebody say, "Hey, can I run your res- license and registration?" Those words right there, license and registration, mm-hmm. could have been enough to just be like, "Oh shh." It was more than just getting mistaken for an assassin, right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Like it, it's, it's that close con- contact to police who then are going to look at his past mm-hmm. in some way. And I, I and think he had a mole that I think he connected yeah, back to. He had, a, he had a mole on one side. Of, it was close to his mouth on the, on the side, mm-hmm. um, his left side. He actually had that, ended up having that removed. Yeah. So I'm thinking he was thinking about somebody from Omaha talking to the police or maybe even a photograph. Mm-hmm. When he right. was young, right. getting out. He also apparently at some point had his ears done. Mm. As his ears were still prominent, even as an adult, where they kind of, they were out. He'd grown into them. Like there's one picture um, that surfaced of him and his first wife together. You can still see his ears are a little bit prominent. And the, the only other picture we have later in life, the ears are very, very flat to his head. Mm-hmm. So there's some indication that during that time period, he had his ears done. Uh, his family, uh, his wife and kids, his actual, his wife and his biological kids did remember uh, when he got his mold on, because um, they, they they do remember that. They don't. Nobody said anything about the ears, but that could have been before mm-hmm. they met. But mm. they definitely mentioned that he got the mole removed because he had it for a long time. Yes, he he was he was concerned, and then he had like this kind of weird final meeting. With the stepdaughters, right? Gave them some words of wisdom before disappearing forever. Mm. Moved to New Zealand, and five years later to uh, Australia. It was in Queensland, and uh, the 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 articles I don't think ever say where he lived, uh, but he was buried in uh, Tambourine Mountain. So I'm guessing that's where he lived. Mm-hmm. Somewhere near there. Sure. Yeah, it seems reasonable, but you know, yeah. technically he didn't. He could have lived somewhere else. He could have been buried there. Mm-hmm. That's an hour south of Brisbane. Uh, yeah, so he was there um, for many years. He traveled to the United States many times on business. He stopped after 9-11 uh, and then no longer entered the U.S. He had uh, a movie he liked, with Clint Eastwood. It was Escape from Alcatraz. Go figure. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. A very small clue. <laughs> yeah, right. small clue. Yeah. But interestingly enough, as much as he loved music, once he, like, once he had that meeting with the the stepdaughters, he he didn't have anything to do with music after that. Mm. Like his family said, they they don't remember him, like even really like liking to listen to music. Like yeah. he never, he, they never knew he played musical instruments. Mm-hmm. They never knew anything. But music was a big part of his life, something he really enjoyed. You gotta imagine the kind of will it takes to just yeah. be like, I love this, but I don't want to get caught, so right. I'm never doing it again. I'm changing lots of things about my life. Yeah. yeah. And think about like the mole, you can make a case, mm-hmm. right? Because it's, it's in a specific place. Yeah. And somebody could look at that and be like, right, well, it's the same place. Possibly identifiable. Yeah. yeah. But the saxophone? Like, I don't know. That seems like a pretty weak, like, oh, you're playing the saxophone. There's this archaic case from Nebraska. <laughs> <clears throat> Didn't that he, dude played the saxophone can, too. Can it you must see be two, the same? You see two beat cops in Australia, <laughs> yeah. sitting like a you know like a like a Land Cruiser, like right. a Land Cruiser pickup truck, right? Uh, I guess an Ute, a Ute. I think yeah. it's called a Ute. And uh, you know they're sitting there. 
You see that guy crossing the street with that saxophone? <laughs> looking at it, reading a newspaper or something. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Huh? exactly. Yeah, yeah, he's <laughs> looking up, looking down, looking up. <laughs> he he's, looks familiar. He's got the local Queensland newspaper. <laughs> Wait, but no mole. But the saxophone. <laughs> yeah, but he's got no mole. <laughs> Like, there, was, there was this case from years ago, and was it in Queensland? No, no, it wasn't even in Australia. No, it wasn't, no you're so, thinking so, of the wrong. It was America. Yeah. Nebraska. What's that? <laughs> Nebraska. Where's Nebraska? Is it somewhere on the East Coast? I have no idea. What's a Nebraska? <laughs> uh, uh, I'm sorry. I got to say, when, when the, every time we talk about the mole and having the mole removed, I'm, I'm just reminded of, of um, Mel Brooks' classic, Men in Tights. <laughs> the the molds. And it's a classic... Mm -hmm. Mel Brooks yeah, yeah. move. Like he did it like History of the World Part One. Uh other movies like just mole moving around. Right, right. I still love the reaction. <laughs> See, wasn't your mole on the other side? I have a mole. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I I think my favorite mole reference <laughs> is 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 Austin probably, Powers. Is probably is Austin Powers. Yeah. Yeah. yeah I think it was uh, Goldmember. Um <laughs> Like a mole. <laughs> Don't say mole. <laughs> it's funny because when that when that uh, when Don't that movie mold, when Goldmember mold. comes up on streaming services, uh -huh. you know, you know, you click through the shows yeah. and it plays just a short yeah piece of it. You know, it doesn't do the thing with like Tom Cruise and Danny DeVito. It doesn't do that. It does the 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 mole the mole <laughs> the mole scene with the the kid from the, that show. Uh -huh. uh, I forget it. This show. Yeah, Wonder Years. Pie. No, oh no, yeah, it was Fred Savage. Fred Savage, right? Fred, yeah. Um, you know, some people don't like Michael Myers. You know, they think he didn't really shine on on Saturday Night Live. He did a good job, in my opinion, on SNL. Yeah, uh, Mike Myers is one of my favorite. Yeah, I think he did. You know, I, I think some people are like, well, you know, it's like um, there's other more talented people. No, no, Mike Myers. Mike Myers is talented. Mm -hmm. He's a talented guy, and he really absolutely. showed it in that movie. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, I'm sorry, I, Mike Myers. It, uh, it's an underrated movie. It really doesn't hold up really super well these days, but, um, so I married an ax murderer. Yeah. Told, yeah. yeah. That yeah. was great. Especially like it he was. plays, he plays his own dad yeah. with a super Scottish accent. Mm -hmm. I love that. <laughs> like Mike Myers, Scottish accent is amazing. It is. Yeah. It yeah. really is. He's yeah. very, um, very talented and has such a range too, to be able to play all those different characters at the same time in so many different movies, odd one, uh, yeah. odd ones, but just, I don't know. Yeah. You're yeah. right. Yeah, he's 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 underrated, um, and he played a lot of characters in the three Austin Powers movies. Mm -hmm, right, you know, it was not just uh, Doctor Evil mm -hmm. and the and Austin Powers, but a bunch of other. Right, you know, some of them kind of disgusting. Oh, yeah, uh, but you know that was the humor. Right, right. That was, uh, you know, I th I think a lot of people look at those movies as very lowbrow, and I think he gets caught up with that. But they were actually sophisticated mm -hmm. as far as humor. It, it was it was a sophisticated sure. series. Well he, thought out. Yeah. He did a series on Netflix not long back that was amazing. Um, it was like conspiracy theorist stuff. Oh, I don't remember what the title was. Uh, uh, the Pentaveret. It's called the Pentaveret. Made in 2022 last year. It was, it's it's hilarious. It's absolutely hysterical. If you get a chance to watch the Pentaveret, it's funny. Yeah. It is so funny. <laughs> I hope they, they come back with the uh, Austin Powers 4. That's what I hope. I, I See, that's the thing. I always wanted them to do uh, a bunch of Austin Powers movies, but I wanted them to like do a different actor after like the fourth one mm -hmm. or fifth one. <laughs> like, and then have him come back, have Mike Myers to do one, and then just have a, have somebody else do it for a while. Mm -hmm. um, just co to completely spoof the Bond flicks. <laughs> that's true. Yeah. Yeah. Like there's a, the Timothy Dalton, yeah. right? Like kind of. I was like, like um, Sean Connery first, and then Michael Moore, and then, and then somebody said that Michael Moore was going to do more Bond movies than uh, than Sean Connery did. Or Roger or, Moore. Or Roger Moore. Mm -hmm. Roger Moore. Yeah. Yeah. Michael Moore did documentaries later. <laughs> but right, yeah, yeah, Roger Moore. Like, oh, some Roger Moore is going to do more Bond fil films than you. No, he's not. <laughs> Comes yeah. out of retirement. Yeah, never say never. Never again. say never again. Mm -hmm. It was titled that because when he did his, the movie, the Bond flick before that, he said, "I'm never playing Bond again." And then when he came back to play Bond, his wife was like, "Well, never say never again." <laughs> so he's like, "That's the title of the movie," which is ex which is Thunderball. Like, never say never again is Thunderball. Um, it also is not done by the same Bond, the official Bond production studio. Oh, really? Correct. Okay, yeah. I didn't know that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, you think when you think of Bond, right? You have um, you have Sean Connery, Roger Moore, uh, Pierce Brosnan. Mm-hmm. A lot of people forget Pierce Brosnan. Pierce Brosnan was, Brosnan was great. I, I like Pierce Brosnan. I thought he was actually really good. Sean yeah. Connery. I don't think you can ever really beat him. Sure. As far as no, I, I don't, he's a classic. He's a yeah. classic. Uh, even who's a Daniel Craig? Daniel Craig. He, he's good, but Sean Connery in his prime. Yeah. yeah. I actually really appreciated Daniel Craig after I started reading the books. He, he really much more encapsulates what Bond was in those books. He's very good. Much yeah. much more much more modern and updated. Yeah. But uh, but still, that Bond was was very grizzled. Yeah. I mean, he was a war veteran uh, from World War uh, World War Two in the first book, Casino Royale. Um, which is really funny. The movie Casino Royale with Daniel Craig, mm-hmm. like the first half of that movie, nothing to do with the book. <laughs> <laughs> nothing. The book, the book starts like right at the midpoint of that movie, right? He gets on the train with with, with mm-hmm. uh, uh, Vesper Lynn, uh, and they're heading in, in towards um, towards the town, and that's where the book starts. <laughs> Everything before that, which is a huge amount of stuff. Mm-hmm. Everything before that, not in any of the books, <laughs> nothing. <laughs> yeah, I, I think I think Daniel Craig brought something special to it. I think I'm always going to like Sean Connery the best, though. But yeah, this kid Connery's the best Bond. I did like Pierce Brosnan. I thought he, I think he was competitive with Sean Connery. I don't know as good, but he was competitive. I was surprised because you wouldn't think of Pierce as that, you know, strong actor for that particular role. Yeah. Uh, Timothy Dalton is the one that I just could never, I just, and the movies weren't bad, mm-hmm. but he just didn't strike me as a British secret agent. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Some people can really pull that off. Some people just can't. I mean, it's okay. But yeah. Roger Moore's movies, were, oh, they were always like, to me, they were kind of almost spoofish, mm-hmm. like in comparison to to the, the Bond ones or to the Connery ones. And Timothy Dalton was just like, this is filler. <laughs> this is a filler Bond. And then <laughs> Pierce Brosnan kind of came in. They, they really wanted to have Bond be like really, really suave. Mm-hmm. I, he was he was there. But I, th- I think they missed out on the opportunity to have Richard Grieco play Bond. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but he did get his chance, his chance to play a super spy in a movie called If Looks Could Kill in 1991. It's one of my all-time favorite movies. <laughs> If you've never had a chance to see it, you probably won't because it's not for <laughs> streaming anywhere. I know. I've looked. It's it's a phenomenal movie. <laughs> also had Linda Hunt in it. Mm. Yeah. She's been she's been in, in a lot of stuff, but you never really know that she's there unless mm-hmm. she's there. Well, I think this ta- that tangent. Oh. <laughs> This episode of Tangents. was brought to you by the uh, wait, the mole story. <laughs> the mole story. Brought mole, to you by moles. 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 <laughs> and, uh, which brings us back to William Leslie Arnold because he had a mole removed. Right. I was yeah. going to say about the uh, saxophone thing. Uh, really, um, yeah, he really had to disconnect from mm-hmm. his former life. And, um, you know, maybe he was really paranoid at that point. And, yeah, it might have been a weak thing, but any association maybe with a past life. He would have cut ties. You're right, though. That would have been incredibly tough, taking a part of you. But it's either, in his mind, maybe get caught or give up things. And I don't want to get caught. I've evaded it this long. And at that point, he actually had a full-on family. Yeah. And he was like, I've got something to lose now if I go back to prison. It's true. Of course, the funny thing is, if he'd gone back to prison, he might have only been there for like two years. <laughs> I, I think in the early days That's that true. was true. But, but the world changed when he was out. And I wonder if... Um, if the political leanings of the fifties would have persisted in the nineties, you know, I, I think, I think he might've been, uh, I think the sentiment might've been different then, you know, life is life, especially with the escape charge on top of it. But, you know, you're supposed to, like in theory, the law of the time is supposed to apply, mm-hmm. but I'm really talking about the, the, the sentiment of the time that mm-hmm. doesn't have to, yeah. stay constant or be applied, you know, it's right. not retroactive. Yeah. So, you know, the attitude, you know, that was a gift that the Board of Pardons was giving yeah. in the 50s that they might not have felt so inclined to give in the 90s or later. That's true. So he he might have also seen kind of like the punitive nature of the United States and, you know, kind of increasing drastically in the last 40 years, 30, 40 years. 
Yeah, he, de- he definitely did not want to get caught. Um, death would get him, though, on August the 6th, 2010. Uh, he was 67. I think his, uh, the age is different. It's reported differently in different places because it got confused by his date of birth change. Yeah. But he was 67 mm-hmm. um, when, when he died. So not, you know, that's kind of young. But considering he was supposed to be in prison, yeah, he had a, he had a full life. That's true. He did. Mm. Yeah. Really long, uh, long life, full life. When he he did a lot of stuff, mm-hmm. and you know, right up until twenty twenty two, they were still people were still speculating about like where is he? Did he survive? Is he dead? Is he alive? Like, no, yeah, he was alive and in Australia. Mm-hmm. And hanging out with his family. Yeah. His... Yeah, and still working. I don't yeah. know if he's working at the time he died because he, he was sick for a little bit, but <clears throat> you know, he <clears throat> he was successful. Like he had he had money. He didn't have to Yeah. You know. He only lived two years longer than, than the guy he escaped with. Mm. Jim Harding. hmm Yeah, Jim always felt as though he was the lucky one, um, because he could reclaim his life. Right. Got released <clears throat> and all. Yeah. He got caught soon enough so that 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 kind of really liberal attitude toward mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. inmates was still in place. Yeah, sure. Like with the escape, you would think like, what are these guys doing <laughs> with the board of pardons? Like, well, this guy, he murdered someone in a robbery. Oh yeah, then he escaped. Oh, let's let him out, let him out. Is that what we're thinking? Let him out, all right, great. Uh, uh, I, was, I was thinking about, I was thinking of a couple of years, but if you guys are saying let him out, I'm, <laughs> all right. I, I, I can get by that. I was leaning toward life, but you know, you're, <laughs> But I don't want to be different was, from you guys. I, I, I don't know. I might be the conservative voice in the room. <laughs> I was thinking about throwing him in a hole and throwing away the key. But if both of you are set on letting him go, I guess I'm just going to have to let him go. <laughs> Two uh, to one vote. Right. <laughs> Majority rules. Yeah. All right. Yeah. All right. <laughs> yeah. They, were, they were very generous. Yeah, they were. Very, very surprising. You don't think of the uh, those rural states in the Midwest – uh, no. As as really like soft on crime, mm-hmm. that's that's not what I would have expected. Certainly not now. You know, maybe that was different earlier. You know, fifties or so. Yeah. Still can't get past he killed his parents. Like I think that's just something you'd think that they would, uh, you know, like consider. Like, uh, okay, you want to say the armed robbery? Maybe he didn't mean to. I don't know Jim Harding's story, right. but let's say maybe sure. he was the driver sure. or something. Like I don't think he was. I think he actually shot somebody, but. I don't know. I don't know. You know, it just right. seemed like that. It's like, well, I didn't think it was loaded, and I tripped over something, accidentally shot the dude. Yeah, I was reaching for I the beef jerky, <laughs> and yeah, you know. And there's a trigger there. Yeah, yeah, maybe. Um, it's like, look, you know those cap guns they've got in all the stores? <laughs> I thought it was a cap gun. Turns out they keep the 22s right there, so I just grabbed a cap gun. And <laughs> yeah. For some reason, the shop owner kept it loaded. <laughs> All sorts of excuses people have. Mm-hmm. Right, of course. But, yeah. you know, when you have a, a very liberal board, they should be like, oh, wow, that's great. Oh, terrible. Terrible. I should let him go. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah. But I, I think that Arnold really, if he just waited the two years, he'd yeah. have gotten out and been able to go on with his life. But I don't know. I think that he definitely had the um, like the impulse, the impulse to do it. And just like just like the killing his his mom was it was impulse driven, emotionally driven. I think that he was really on the like his my appeal was denied, so I'm not gonna get out of here. Here, you want to get out of here? Yeah, mm-hmm. <laughs> let's do that. Definitely. Yeah. Oh, I can't back out now. Right. <laughs> yeah. Already started filing away or cutting away rather. The murder was probably impulsive too, to some degree. Mm-hmm. You know. Yeah. So. That was his and nature. Even yeah. even outside, even when he went out, if it, if he said outside, that I, this I'm 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 ending it right now, like that was still an impulsive. He wasn't out there for like four or five hours, going like I'm gonna I'm gonna end it now. You know what? I gotta figure out what I'm gonna do first. Like he wasn't sitting on a on a on a rock somewhere just. <laughs> and then I'll tell Rose that they went off to on a train, no plane, no train. Like <laughs> yeah. it was. I'm gonna go end it. Walk in the house, get the gun. Like that was the the extent of it. So I can I can understand really why the prosecutor would have been a little bit more willing to go to to second degree because it was kind of a passion moment. 
Like, yeah, he thought about it beforehand, but he only thought about it like 30 seconds before he went to go get the gun. Like it wasn't, it wasn't, uh, it wasn't like a, a master stroke plan that took six weeks to set up. Mm -hmm. Maybe they thought he was a little provoked. Yeah. 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 Uh, so no one ever escaped from that prison. It was, it was the last one mm. to get out since then, since 1958, when, when him and Jim Harding escaped. Those are the last two. They closed the music program, that's why. Yeah. <laughs> I certainly, uh, their policy on uh, getting close to the fence probably changed too, like letting people like throw things over. <laughs> Um, that's, that's Pro probably at a setup, like keep an eye on the fence line. <laughs> it's not just people going out. We don't want things coming in either. They had to add it to the manual. I thought it was an unspoken thing. Shouldn't keep them near the fence. Shouldn't throw things over. And what the guy who threw the thing over said he was, he was, he was there for an order. Like <laughs> somebody placed an order and he was just delivering it. So I let it, I let him deliver. He's got to be able to deliver. He's a delivery person, Right. He's Everybody's got a job to do. They got to do their job. I, I also think with with Leslie, kind of at the age of being able to escape prison, uh, and not get caught is over. Mm. Like you could probably still get out with help, depending on the jail or prison. But the problem is these days with the cameras and the DNA and internet. Like there's, you're not yep. going to get far right. right without like millions of dollars and like a, a team. Mm -hmm. you know. I don't know. I don't know. Depends. I mean, if you have a nice long beard, it's a lot easier to shave a beard mm -hmm. off than it is to grow a new mm -hmm. one. So, you know, if you grow a beard in prison and you do a really good, and that's the thing, you got to be on good behavior. Like there's a, there's a story, like there was a guy who was on good behavior, got on a work detail and the, the work detail actually took them out of the prison down to like local courthouse, right? You figure that's super secure, right? Mm -hmm. It's the courthouse go down to the local courthouse. They're painting a room. So the inmates are, are doing the painting. And the guy goes to the, to the uh, CEO and goes, I, I, can I go use the bathroom? And like, yeah. So he goes to the bathroom and then just walks out the front door. Mm -hmm. He was on Unsolved Mysteries. Like he was gone for like five years. <laughs> like just walked out of the courthouse because he was on good behavior. And you get on good behavior and then you, it's, a, it's a matter of trust. And we start trusting. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, there's some there's some prisons. Uh, I know years ago, Greaterford, on Pennsylvania, had a had a warehouse outside the the main building where they would have like textiles delivered because they make jeans or something there. Mm -hmm. And some of the people there were life sentence. You know, they come outside the walls, work there, just you know, totally outside the building. Like you know, if you had any help, like transportation, probably get away. Yeah, you know. Um, Speaking of, uh, uh, we're talking about uh, escaping prison. This one comes to mind. This is a true story. There's a guy who, he, he he's in prison for life. He plans out this escape, and the escape is, involves getting into a laundry truck. And, like, he pays off a bunch of people to help him set this thing up. He gets in the laundry truck. Laundry truck drives out. He waits where he is. Laundry truck opens the, opens the back gate. He manages to sneak out and finds that he's in another prison. <laughs> <laughs> like the laundry trucks making like hit, hitting up different different spots in the area like he and uh it picked up one shipment from the prison he was in and they were dropping stuff and picking stuff up at another prison and he <laughs> like walks out into, <laughs> into the loading dock of another prison <laughs> it's like you gotta think to yourself like i how uh, yeah <laughs> how the amount of disappointment you, at that moment. And, and there's, you're caught at that point. Yeah, like, yeah. there's no place, no way you can be like, I don't know how I got here. <laughs> and no way you can just walk out the front door. Like, they, they, they're they going to know. Like, yeah. you're in a prison. Wait, what do you mean we've got one extra? <laughs> we did Raise your hand if you're not supposed to be here. We did count this morning and we had, you know, 1,400 exactly. We got 1,401. Did we get anybody new in? No? What? <laughs> People usually don't just walk into prisons voluntarily. Yeah, usually, yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah, that would be bad. Maybe maybe try to exit the truck when it was in, like at a stoplight or something. <laughs> when stop when, and not wait that long. Uh, yeah. So, one of the one of the strangest cases I think we've ever covered. Mm -hmm. um, and we've covered covered some strange ones. We really have. Sure. 
Yeah. yeah. I think this is definitely the strangest murder part mm-hmm. we've covered. Yeah, because you know, there's a murder part in the beginning, but then you have this long... This, this guy just lived his whole life. The murder was not really the focus. Mm-hmm. No, the, the rest the rest of his life was more the focus. Right. Because like, he, he just he vanished. Yep. Was gone for a while. And then found after he was dead. And the U.S. Marshals were like, you know, we're actually kind of glad that he died. Because mm-hmm. yeah, yeah. then we don't have to, like, pull him away from his family. <laughs> Because he'd have been in his 80s at this point. We don't have to pull him away from his ha- family and extradite him back to the U.S. Mm-hmm. to to serve. Yeah. One thing that one thing that bugged me. Um, this is is one of those things. There was a picture, I think, in the newspaper that had the or one of the places of the the marshal flew to Australia and put like his badge mm-hmm. and the wanted poster. I think on the on the wrong tombstone on the on. The, the right guy, but had the wrong name. Right. The, the John Damon. The John Damon. Vincent Damon, yeah. And it's just one of those things. What's the what's the national debt right now in the United States? <laughs> right. Like 30, Too much. Is it, how much is it? It's, it's, it's in the trillions, right? Probably. Like yeah. some, some yeah. 31 trillion or something really like ridiculous like Astronomical, that. yeah. Uh, how about not flying the marshal to Australia? Just for a photo op. Let's just take their word for it. You know, Australian authorities are competent. If they say the guy <laughs> is dead, we, that's good enough for me as far as my tax dollars are right, concerned. Right, right, right. Well, if we can give, if we can give the military like five hundred billion dollars a year, we we could we could we could take you know what two three grand out for <laughs> for the marshal to go to Australia. <laughs> To, to wrap up a case. Yeah, there was a 60 Minutes. I think it was the, the last 60 Minutes that talked about the the military and the spending. It, it was unbelievable. It was, it was worse than I thought in many oh, ways. Oh, yeah. 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 Like, they, they get to the point near the end of the year when the budget the budget stuff's coming out, they, they, they have to spend their surplus, like, as much as they possibly can. There, there are whole, like, research projects that are built specifically just to funnel money into so that they can uh, claim that it's it's spent so that they can mm. get more next year. Mm. And it, it's, it's, I'm sorry, the military budget is fat and bloated at this point. Yeah, it's, it's ridiculous. They're talking about... And they make money by selling some of our surplus materials to yeah. overseas to other countries. Yeah, they're talking about huge profit margins. Mm-hmm. Spo- the, the contractors are supposed to make ten to twelve percent. That's what the that's how it's geared. Right. And and there was a guy in there talking about forty percent margins. Mm. Well, why why are, that's tax dollars? Like that's the money comes from from us. Yeah, but either way, that just bothered me. It's like you know, a, a ticket to Australia is not affordable. Right. Um. It's, yeah. it's a little bit more affordable than than a you know F sixteen. Yeah. No, I mean. Comparatively, right. But <laughs> right. they could have just been like, are you sure he's dead? We're pretty sure, man. We're pretty sure. You just you just stay in the U.S. <laughs> okay. I, just, I didn't want to have to come all the way down to Australia and check. <laughs> yeah, you don't have to. You don't have to. We're, we're good. We we have dead bodies here, too, in murders. <laughs> <laughs> really? <laughs> like, what do dead bodies look like in Australia? <laughs> are they different? <laughs> are they different? Uh, all right. So any final thoughts on, uh, on, on uh, Leslie? Uh, <clears throat> so the kind of the crux of this whole thing is the DNA, right? That's the sun uploading the DNA and DNA, uh, as far as genealogy websites and things like that, um, has for many people is very much a bad thing. You know, I, I don't want the government or whomever having my DNA, selling it, using it for whatever purposes, nefarious or otherwise, but obviously there's a, there can be a benefit to it too, because then you could find uh, long lost family members. You could find out stuff about your past. They could, uh, you know, government law enforcement agencies can use it to find criminals or make connections in criminal cases and things. So it's a, obviously a huge uh, advancement and a very good one too, but also has, you know, kind of some bad connotations for a lot of people thinking that it can be used for for bad purposes. Thankfully, it was good in this perp- in this instance, uh, in that it connected a lot of dots, and it didn't really get anybody anywhere other than the knowledge of what actually happened. It's not like we caught the bad guy or anything like that. But um, it was interesting 
that they were able to use it in a good way, you know, and and hopefully that I, mean, I don't know what that feels like for his family to now know about a dark past for their dad. Maybe there's, you know, oh, wow, that's really messed up. But still, you know, they knew him in a certain way despite his actual past. So I don't know. It's it's a weird thing, but it was a very interesting thing. DNA can be used in so many different ways, is used in so many different ways. Yeah, I imagine there was a lot of moments where they went back and they're like, now that one thing mm, he did sure. makes sense. Or that other thing he did make sense. Sure, that's true. Yeah. And probably as many moments where it just seems totally disconnected. Mm -hmm. Like that's not even the person. You're describing a different person. Right, right. Yeah. That's why he wanted to visit that prison so many times or, or talked about that prison mm -hmm. or something. Yeah. Hey, Mike? Uh, this case brought back to, to me, like thing I've heard from several other cases, uh, the genetic genealogy, right? The DNA, you know, going into a public genealogy website and then being used by, by law enforcement to, to find somebody. In this case, they actually had the brother's DNA and kind of it was a f direct familial match. Like, like this is, you know, son of, or this is son of uh, your brother. Like, so like this is uncle to nephew. Mm -hmm. Like that's really close. Some of the other genetic genealogy cases have been much more distant where they've had to to uh, dig down to, okay, so this is somebody's fifth cousin, three times removed DNA relation, but it all comes back down to this person like six generations back. But then we're going to track all the way back up to X person. And if we can get this person's DNA, we'll be able to prove this, that it's mm -hmm. that person. And like I, I find that to be completely fascinating, I, like the, the, the process that they use to do that, the investigation uh, that's how they caught the Golden State Killer. Mm -hmm. right. uh, they've caught several other other people who, who did things 30, 40 years ago, like DNA just been sitting around for it. So DNA is is becoming much more of a tool for uh, law enforcement. We we have it as our our um, we carry it with us from the day we're born, of course. It's our, our the big identifier. Um, but as a tool for law enforcement, it's becoming much, much more uh, prominent. Mm -hmm. And I think part of that is because it is such a unique marker. Mm -hmm. I mean, despite what, despite what we've been told for hundreds of years, fingerprints are actually not unique. Um, there's an interesting case about a guy who was con uh, convicted in absentia in Spain for a murder uh, based on fingerprints because his fingerprints were in an uh, international database. But he actually was living in Washington State, I think it was, somewhere out, uh, midwest, uh, out in the um, northwest, mm. uh, and, and was there at the time the murder had committed and hadn't been ever been in Spain, like had never been there, and was living in the United States. But he was convicted in absentia because they had his fingerprints. Mm. Uh, so fingerprints are not unique. Uh, as much as we're told they are. Uh, but DNA kind of is. Yeah. Like it's so, it's got so much data that, that it's, it is kind of m much more unique uh, than any, anything else. So that's the thing that's being used as an identifier. But that being said, if you're not leaving much DNA around, it, it's not going to be found. Mm -hmm. And uh, less, Leslie, didn't leave a lot behind, mm -hmm. um, not of prominence. He, he managed to find a way to, uh, to sneak under the radar, to stay, stay hidden as, as technology was getting better and better. Uh, but the other thing that strikes me is that he didn't, <laughs> he didn't go into, you know, just criminal patterns. Right? A lot of people who mm -hmm. end up going to prison and then escaping or, or, or even being released these days. Yeah end up committing crimes again, partially because uh, prison is kind of the criminal college mm -hmm. uh, or, or criminal, criminal trade school. Like if you mm -hmm. don't want to learn a trade, um, what trade? Criminality, go to prison. Mm -hmm. <laughs> You're going to learn how to be a better criminal. Um, you learn that and you come out and then the natural thing is to just commit more crimes because that's what you know how to do. Mm -hmm. uh, Les spent eight years in prison and then got out. And as far as we know, he never committed another crime at ever it's for, the rest of, for the rest of his life. Yeah. Um, another 40, like 42 years 
and never committed another crime, right. lived a successful life, mm -hmm. uh, which which tells me that recidivism is kind of caused by prisons rather than solved by them. Mm. Well, it was an unusual, yeah, sixteen year old killing his parents. There's <clears throat> a highly specific kind of set of motives that we yeah. associate with that. Yeah. That would be unlikely to be replicated. Uh, and it's not going to get more parents. Yeah, um, but if his, and that's the thing, if his anger issues were so prevalent and so uh, just random, then anybody who made him angry was risking Hulk coming out and shooting them. Like, yeah. but it wasn't, it was very specific. That's why I think it was very specific to his mother being mm -hmm. the trigger person. Like yep. she treated him a specific way that nobody else treated him. And that's what brought out the rage and the impulse. And yeah, that specific set of circumstances was never going to happen again. Um, which is why I'm not sure why, why I think that we need to look at individual cases on an individual basis instead of just having a blanket. This is a, the thing for everybody. Yeah, well, the, there's the deterrent component. And that's the part that always kind of jams up the system, right? <laughs> like you have, you have a judge say, well, I don't think your punishment should be that great. But based on what you did, the deterrent needs to be significant enough. Yeah. You know, well, the yeah. problem is that, that nothing we do is going to deter anyone else from doing something. People people aren't deterred by what happens to somebody else. And I've already done the thing that I'm <laughs> that I'm on trial for, mm -hmm. or that I'm going to get punished for. Like, so it's not going to deter deter me from right. going back in time and doing that. Right. Like, yeah, it's a deterrent for others. Right? Deterrent, but but yeah. what happens to somebody else isn't a deter deterrent for to anybody. And like, unless it's like super public. Uh, and super grisly. And even then, we can look back in, in history and be like, okay, well, public executions didn't stop people from doing crimes mm -hmm. either. Yeah. Uh, yeah it's, it's, it's tricky. It's, it's, it's tough when you see someone who, who left prison, well, escaped prison, and then never commits another offense. Like, it's, it does make you think, like, was prison the best place for him? Mm. But also, at the same time, you know, we, we get to hear sort of a lot of his story, but the parents' story is... Kind of forever closed. Yeah, and and they yeah. were shot to death in their house, and <clears throat> they may. I mean, the mother may have been mean. A lot of parents are mean. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. Doesn't yeah. Yeah, Didn't deserve I, that. Yeah, so it's you know it bothers me that they. Um, well, and we, we won't know exactly how how or what mean really is. We have we have uh, what was told by and so the few from people way, said and it. a few other people that yeah. said how he was treated. And, and let's be honest. Even in the fifties, they've been downplaying how just just how nasty that could have been. Mm -hmm. um, but behind closed doors, we don't know what was going on, and, and the kind of trauma and abuse that can really negatively impact someone's mental health, um, and how they interact with others later in life, as we saw with with Leslie's ki uh, stepdaughters. Mm -hmm. I think that can be really damaging, yeah. and. I don't. I don't want to victim blame or anything, but at the same time, that situation was charged by two people. Mm -hmm. and it was charged by Leslie made the made the impulsive decision, but he might not have made that decision if he hadn't been treated the way he had been for as long as he had been treated that way. Yeah, that comes down back to the 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 the, the abuse victim, the the battered spouse defense, mm -hmm. as they talk about that potentially could have been used in his case. I mean, it wasn't a, a statute at the time or, or a precedent at the time, and he wasn't a spouse. He was a, ki a child. But definitely they still could have seen the, the impact that abuse has on a person's psyche mm -hmm. and their decision-making process and their, their decision to try and defend themselves. Yeah. Uh, and I think that's kind of where we get from that, like mm -hmm. that specific – situation's never going to happen to him again. And yeah, his parents, his dad is the biggest victim, I think, in this, and his brother. Um, it, it, I don't, his dad was either just kind of an enabler through, um, a, enabler through neutrality, like he didn't do anything to stop yeah. it. Um, not that I think that he was enabling and saying, yeah, go, yeah, yeah right. go do that stuff. He just didn't stop it. And I think that's where there might have been a little bit of resentment from from Leslie, but yeah. it, it probably wasn't a planned out, oh, I'm going to shoot dad too. And it was, oh, I'm going to put the gun away, or, or just it had been reloaded as, as in, you know, 
because that's what he's taught to do and just does it. And then impulse or situation happens again, mm. probably not likely to ever happen again for Leslie mm. throughout the, re- and it didn't for the rest of, uh, through the rest of his life. Yeah. Well, after escaping, at least he didn't kill anyone else, but I think I, I would have preferred him staying in prison and, yeah. um, not that, that the modern standard is always the one that's appropriate, but uh, killing both parents, right? That's, that's such a heinous offense. Um, yeah, and you know, especially considering he would have been out in probably two or three years. Yeah, just it just seems like. <laughs> yeah, again, I think it was impulsive, but once he was in, mm-hmm. he was in. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yep. So I think overall, Leslie was no good. It was yeah. no good. Yeah. Right. right. Yeah. All right, so we'll we'll wrap it up there. Any ideas for? Well, on this one, I don't know. Maybe a Mercury. 1957 Mercury. 1957 Mercury, Mercury if I can, yeah. can find the STL for it. Or um, or a saxophone. That's a good idea. Maybe a saxophone. Maybe a saxophone with a mask on it. Yeah. Saxophone with a hacksaw blade or something. Uh, or just mask and hacksaw blade. Yeah, maybe. <laughs> something like that. I'll get the Groucho Marx mask Make. with a hacksaw blade. <laughs> so, so the 57 Mercury or Groucho Marx with a hacksaw blade. Very good. Uh, so... Please put any comments in the comment section. We're going to try to answer uh, some comments in shorts. Kind of get on board with shorts mm-hmm. and come and see. and uh, oh. release those. So you know, like, and, and of course, in the comments, we, we could answer. Oh, you meant short yeah. video, not short pants. Right, not <laughs> short. You're already in shorts. I'm already in shorts. I <laughs> say, I can respond in shorts. I'm doing it right now. <laughs> yeah, so that's something. So is uh, Jeff. We're yeah. all about it already. That's right. We have the curve. <laughs> so that's something we're going we're gonna, to uh, try doing. Uh, and, of course, we have many more ideas for uh, murder part episodes and mm-hmm. alien lizard humanoids, but always yeah. looking for more. So any ideas, yeah. put those in the comments section. Thank you so much for watching this episode of the murder part, and we'll talk to you soon.